Discovery, go at throttle up. Go and throttle up.
Good morning, everybody. We're uh, we're up a little bit early today, but it's not every day that NASA puts a probe on a very heavy rocket teed up for a journey to the outer parts of the solar system to look at a metallic asteroid. But that's what we have today. Welcome to Psyche Mission Coverage here. Uh, in about 35 minutes, we're going to see a Falcon Heavy go out of uh, out of Complex 39A at uh, Kennedy Space Center. And we're going to see a potentially super important mission for the future here. I mean, amongst other things. We did just have the... Uh, we did... Did just have the Osiris Rex findings come back, proving there's organic compounds on a near Earth asteroid. And now we have this. Oh, yeah. Monitoring all that and looking at it. And, uh, Very nice. One of those things we have to deal with. We're also watching propellant load. The that ass as we droid to probe. Lift off, uh, today. In just a few seconds, we're going to start RP 1 load at the second stage. Let's listen in. Stage 2 RP-1 load has started. Okay. They've already started we fueling. You can tell from the condensation there. Let me the just get the audio balanced up. And following that, we'll lox load it. But the long pole in the tent are those three boosters that we're looking at. Yeah, absolutely. We're about halfway uh, filled with the uh, uh, RP-1 in the boosters Tubes. there as we look at the data on the screen. And uh, LOX is continuing to flow in all three boosters uh, in the, into, uh, to make sure everything's filled this, nope. this morning for propellant. And uh, second stage has started also. We're very excited to get all this propellant done. This is the most critical and long portion of Organic the compounds on an asteroid going on, yeah. And ready for liftoff. Pretty cool stuff. Very good. And, uh, I've been actually reading about the scientific findings from the OSIRIS-REx mission. It, it, believe it or not, that's not anything new. and But... That's what NASA was expecting. We were expecting, you know, parts of the solar system to be made out of other parts of the solar system. That's kind of, you know. Especially with that near-Earth asteroid. Bennu is not that far from Earth. I, I had previously said that it, it's further out. It's not that far. It's in a near-Earth orbit. It's very close to Earth. So, it kind of... Osiris-Rex, like, it isn't that big of a breakthrough that they found water near Earth. But... It does prove that stuff that's floating around near the planet is made out of similar stuff as as this planet. That's that's the big part. <laughs> that part is more important than finding water. The fact that there is a gigantic, you know, three or four mile wide asteroid floating out there that could literally have been a part of Earth at the time, I think that's way more important. Uh, but what do I know? Now... Hey, Dizzy, eight-month resub. Now, this one, the Psyche mission, is going to an asteroid that's way further out. It's going to the, well, the asteroid Psyche. The, mission is, the mission's namesake. That mission is supposedly a core. It's supposedly, I think it's called a protoplanet. I'm, I'm not that good on my planetary geology there. Um, I think it's a protoplanet. It's metallic. So, what NASA's theory is, is that Psyche is actually a planet core that didn't plan it enough. It didn't plan it hard enough. That's, that's a really weird way of saying that, but that's pretty much, Discovery. Pretty much what's going on. Hey, Fox, what's going on? 10 month resub. <laughs> no, Vickers. No. No. No, it's ours. You can't have it. Go away. Go away. You had your chance, like the dinosaur. You had your chance. The future is our time. The future is our lives. So, this, uh, this mission... Psyche is not just like an asteroid that could be prospected. It... They're... What they're trying to see is that if it's actually a piece of, like, a part of a planet. Supposedly, Psyche is very similar to the core of Earth. Supposedly. So, like, that, that, that's, what I've been, that's what I've been reading. You know, so I'm not... 
and 100% sold on it because you won't know until you go. That's my rule with these science missions. You won't know until you go. Get out there. Figure it out. Want to figure out what the dirt is made out of on Mars? Send a guy with a shovel. Or a Volkswagen Beetle-sized rover that can hover slam down onto the surface. I mean, that's cool. Those are cool, too. I, I do like those. Send a shovel, some poop, and potatoes. Eat the potatoes, not the shovel or the. Okay, now that we've derailed here, let's uh, let's take a take a nice look at Falcon Heavy. So this this shot right here is taken from NASA's uh, helicopter. This is November four thirty five, November Alpha. It is an EC one thirty five. Airbus helicopter, which should be a Huey. Sorry, I'm not not bitter at all. Did you get the rocket working in Stormworks last night? Yeah, I did, Dizzy. Yep, yep. We're going to science the snot out of it. That's right. That's right. Um, from what I've been hearing from people that are down there, it's a little bit little bit humid today. It looks a little um, swampy down there. Like, Florida always looks swampy, but it's looking a little more swampy than normal. This is not just regular swampy this is advanced swampy what pad are we at 39a man 39a so falcon heavy here is launching with it's the fourth flight for the side cores first flight for the center core the center core will be expanded for performance which is kind of sucks but oh my gosh there's a crush mobile launcher back there that didn't like that didn't like seeing that Movie reference. Yeah, of course. We're going to science the snot out of it. Yeah, look. Yeah, exactly, Pyro. The condensation from the from the cryogenic propellants being loaded onto the vehicle, all the, all the condensation that's being made is just sitting there. A crush mobile launcher. Yep. They scrapped, they scrapped another ML. I'm not happy about it. Just take it for granted. <laughs> it wow, really is a piece of granite. Yep, yep. <laughs> uh, okay, so not magnetic, right? Okay, not much no. iron in that one. No. Now try this no. one. This is a so-called ordinary chondrite meteorite. It's a got little. it's a little magnetic. It's yep. kind of not stick. It's sticking a little bit. Has a little bit of iron and nickel in it. It's kind of like the material you'd find. This would be crustal material, crustal and mantle kind of material. Okay. Now try that meteorite. Whoa! Yes, <laughs> oh my gosh. right. This is it's an iron. It's like there. massively <laughs> stuck on there. This is an iron meteorite. This is part of the Canyon Diablo meteorite. Discovery. Which no one a up. crater wow. in northern Arizona. Okay. Cool. So you saw how strong that magnetic field is on this one, and so we'll be using the magnetometer on the spacecraft uh, to try to detect that kind of magnetic field. And if we see that strong magnetic field, it is a good good indicator that Psyche is a. Is an are they using Falcon Heavy because it's transporting something really he really heavy equipment? Well, Smoke, that asteroid's a good way away. It's the second one. Psyche is not particularly a big satellite. But it needs to go far. <laughs> it needs a lot of... We need a lot of Delta V to get out to, get out to that asteroid. Uh, yeah, so it's... Not that Psyche is a particularly big payload. It's just a, a regular-sized payload, I guess, that needs to go extremely far. Gravity field and really understand some details about how cores form. I love how she turned the magnet up so the Made in China logo was facing the camera. NASA usually doesn't like that. They did say they were in a space race with China the other day. So, I, I think that's kind of funny. Crewed spacecraft like weather satellites, telescopes, many of those end up orbiting the Earth, but Psyche is going to go much farther. NASA's Daryl Nail spoke to an analyst about Psyche's unique trajectory. So we're inside in of a half hour here. Jarmaine Oliver, good to see you again. How you doing? Well, this is your animation here. You're the LSP trajectory analyst. Show us Launch now services what is program. happening here with the second stage and the and the Psyche spacecraft. These trajectory guys are real nerds here. I'm going to let him, let him talk. Going through our first burn. This burn is going to get us to park orbit. During park orbit, we will basically loiter there until the trajectory lines up to get us on an outbound cruise to Psyche. Okay, and so now you're going mm. into that park orbit. And I noticed this These are terms I enjoy. Well, we want to keep the sun about a 90 degree angle, but at the same time, we're doing what we call a barbecue roll where the spacecraft will just spin to keep the temperature gradient across the spacecraft and the launch vehicle the same. You don't want the sun focusing on one particular area that could potentially damage any instruments or any hardware. So it is continuing on the velocity vector, which we see here very clearly. 
the velocity vector. To the sun. This is a long coast phase. Yeah, about 45 minutes or so before we actually get into the injection burn. Is there anything happening during this coast phase? No, we're just pretty much just going through the barbecue roll, tracking the sun, keeping it 90 degrees away. We're approaching now Southern Africa and crossing that continent, mm -hmm. but then getting mm -hmm. ready for that second burn. Right, when we finish crossing over the continent of Africa, then we'll start getting ready to do that injection burn where the vehicle will get into another attitude that will line up with the velocity vector. And is that why we're seeing it start to swing back around? Yes, you're the starting to see that vector. swing a little bit slowly right now. Check our vector, Now the sun Victor. is on the other side of the earth and starting to get into a shadow. So we'll actually be in darkness here as we approach the northwestern coast of Australia. Correct. But that's not a concern to us. We still want to maintain the barbecue roll, as you can see. And as you can see right now, you can we're actually lining up to get to that velocity vector. And when step, once we line up with that, we'll perform that injection burn. All right, we see it now in the dark side of the Earth, starting to point into that velocity vector that you mentioned. And here comes our second burn. Yes. You're about to see the second burn happen right now. It's about two and a half minutes. This would inject us into the orbit that we would need to get to Psyche. Second engine start number I want two. Barbecue now. Your animation has a little vibration there as the engine's giving it the go and then it cuts off. Yes. And now after this burn is complete, we will then get ready to go to the separation attitude. So you see the launch vehicle and the spacecraft it's gonna get turn into again. an attitude where when we separate the spacecraft, the launch vehicle can then go into a, another attitude and perform a burn to get it away from Psyche. I see it swinging back around and here you've labeled Psyche separation. Yes. This is the moment where the second stage comes off the spacecraft. Yes. At this time, we have separated from Psyche. Psyche is on its way. It the does? vehicle is now- Oh my God. To get itself away from Psyche to include recontact and Psyche will be on its way shortly. Great, we don't want to run into the second stage with the spacecraft. It's got a job to do. And first it's going out towards Mars. Yes, it's going to do a Mars flyby to get that gravity assist, the slingshot itself over to the Psyche asteroid. Help save fuel, get out to its destination. That's all a good thing. Yes, sir. Jarmaine, thanks for showing us that. Really thanks for having your time. me. Jarmaine. Sure and we have space enthusiasts coming. watching today's launch from around the world. And we have some recorded questions that they've sent in while some are posting. Okay. Um, so why did they do the barbecue roll? I know it's early, but there's always time for barbecue. Okay. All right. Hey, nice shirt, kid. There you go. So the reason they do that is for thermal. Okay. So they don't... Jermaine, the trajectory engineer, was talking about not frying any equipment on the satellite, and he is 130% right, maybe even 154% right. Repeating, of course. So they don't want to mess up the spacecraft, but it's also there. They also roll the spacecraft to make sure that the propellants don't boil off. You want to ensure even heating on the propellants, uh, especially the liquid oxygen, or else it'll just boil off. <clears throat> don't want that because then you have no then you have no oxidizer up there. And I, I mean, I don't know if you guys knew there's not there's not much oxygen up there. Rockets have to take the oxygen with them to make an explosion. The problem is, is that you don't want to take it. Take taking it as gas is nice, but you got to take it as liquid because it's easier to store liquid in a smaller area because of density. Liquids are denser than gases. I know, I know, it's basic physics here. But what happens is because they need to store oxygen as a liquid, it's really, really freaking cold. Um, like, not like I'm not talking like Canada cold. Or even like Finland cold. I'm talking like not even Antarctica cold. It is like cold, way colder than that. It's, yeah. What is it? Like 190, minus 193 C? Something like that? It's somewhere, it's, it's, it's cold. The sun, <clears throat> I know, this is rocket science after all. We have to be technical. The sun is, in fact, not cold. And sitting in the sun up there can boil off the propellants. It'll heat up the propellants, especially if you, if you heat it unevenly, right? Because then you're then you're cooking off one side of the like some propellants on one side, but all the propellants that are near the other side aren't going to cook off. You don't want that, so they they roll it for thermal protection on the second stage, for the propellants, and for the and for the vehicle. I don't know why they kept calling it the velocity vector, but whatever they they're going to stay what's called anti-normal relative to the velo well rel velocity vector. I almost did it relative to what's called posigrade or prograde, prograde velocity. So prograde velocity basically is the way you're going, the direction that you're going on a spacecraft. If the spacecraft's going this way, they're going to turn so they're parallel or perpendicular to the sun, and then they're going to spin the spacecraft for thermal protection. And with that, I will, I will gladly pass it over to 
Senator, Administrator, Representative, Florida man, Bill Nelson here. Isn't it interesting that asteroids are just fascinating to us because it that gives cool. us He's the right. clues to the origins not only of our solar system but also the universe. Uh, so we brought back Osias Rex. Oh, Science Rex. Yesterday at the Johnson Space Center. And lo and behold. So that's the T event right there? Water in clay. And this is just on the outside of the container. We haven't even opened the container yet. It also has carbon. So if you got water and carbon, you got the building blocks of life. Now, this one, Psyche, we're going to a metallic asteroid, which is a core of some kind of celestial body. Cool. And as a result, we're gonna learn all kind of new things, how these things fly through the solar system and they hit each other and they cause- You're so psyched the for this, oh snap. We have today, Come on, man. Our solar system. And Administrator Nelson, I, you know- I know you have dad humor, but holy balls, like dude. <laughs> six years to get What's going there. on, so buddy? So what are the long-term effects of a mission RP1 like this? Load is complete. Well, it's- what you have to do to get there. Uh, we're using a flyby Mars as a gravity on, man? assist. And that just Good morning. It's a little early over there, huh? But isn't that something? That six years down the road, we're finally going to get the revelation of what we're looking for, but we had to start planning it and building it even several years before this. Right, exactly. It's great to see that we are here on this day for launch. Thank you so much for joining us, Administrator Nelson. Jim and May. So we're looking at this live shot of Falcon Heavy. Uh, this is taken from NASA's EC-135 helicopter, uh, which is circling 39A. I don't, I don't know if you could tell. Um, in case you're seeing all this smoke come off, well, that's it's condensation. And what's, what's happening is I was just talking about cryogenic propellants. So Falcon, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy, the Falcon family of rockets is a semi-cryogenic uh, family of rockets, meaning that, like, okay, engineering names are very literal. They're very, they're not, there's no, like, trick to them. It's a semi-cryogenic rocket, meaning that your commodities on board, one of them is cold and one of them is not. It's not rocket science yet. Yes, it is. Anyway, so the reason why you saw such a big vent come out of the the structure on the left side of the rocket, right? This thing. The reason why you're seeing such a big vent come out of there is because there's there's a fuel line that goes up the structural part of the rocket, and there's also an RP1 line that goes up the side here. Uh, this structure on the side is a TE or transporter erector because it transports and erects. <laughs> the rocket on the launch pad. Like I said, engineers are not good at coming up with names. They lack the people skills to do it. So, now why, why the big vent? Why are they dumping some of that propellant overboard? Why, why is a commodity going overboard? Well, okay, so like I said, liquid oxygen is really, really freaking cold. Really, really cold. And you don't just pump it through a really warm pipe. I don't, I don't know if you guys notice. It's, it's a little warm in Florida. It gets warm down there. You know, more warm than most places. It's a tropical climate, okay? Stop yelling at me. So you don't just pump extremely cold liquid oxygen into a pipe that's extremely warm. What's going to happen? Physics is going to happen, baby. Magic. No, it, the liquid oxygen will very quickly absorb all the heat in the pipe and it'll evaporate and gaseous oxygen isn't getting you very far with a liquid fueled rocket because liquids are, are not gas I'm making some shocking revelations here today I know I know I know man I know I know it's pretty crazy I'm gonna have another cup of coffee so they flow those propellants up and some of the propellant some of that that liquid oxygen does boil off it, so there's a vent at the top of the line right before it you know that that oxidizer line goes into the second stage on falcon heavy and as they're filling it up they vent the oxygen which is exchanged the heat with the pipe it turns to gas or one of my favorite things to say in space flight term terminology called gox gax gax 
think that rocket has GAX. GAX? Gaseous Oxygen Venting System. Doesn't have SCMATs, though. Anyway, so they open up a vent line on the transporter erector to make sure that the liquid oxygen pipe gets fully saturated and doesn't, when they're going to flow propellants into the rocket, no gaseous oxygen, GAX, gets into the, into the second stage. That's why there's that huge vent. The thing is that it's super humid down in Florida today, so humidity is a lot of water vapor in the atmosphere. And when that gaseous oxygen, even though it's a gas, it's still really freaking cold gas. When it hits the atmosphere, it, it condenses the water vapor. So that's why that it's ripping a fat vape off the side of the transporter erector. Liquid is not a gas. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Yep, yep. Hey, I'm all what's going on. So once again, this is the Psyche mission. We are inside of 15 minutes. JPL, which operates She's the at JPL. Deep Space Network. DSN, it baby. It consists of three complexes with large radio dishes that let us communicate with spacecraft that go beyond What's up, Rick? Now, these three My complexes pleasure, dude. are strategically located in California, Spain, and Australia. They provide two-way communication and also help us track and navigate the spacecraft so we can keep them on course. And right now, the Deep Space Network is supporting over 40 missions. The Psyche spacecraft is expected to first communicate with the radio antennas in Canberra, Australia. Then data will come here to Canberra. JPL. The operations team will use it to track Psyche, monitor its health, and send commands as it travels to the metal. You rich also have asteroid. three complexes. Megan, back to you. Forlorn, are you trying to tell me you're crazy? Now riding along with Psyche is NASA's first demonstration of deep space laser communications. Let's bring back NASA's Jasmine it. Hopkins to learn more. I won't admit Thank it. Thank you, Megan. Yes, joining me now is Jason <laughs> Mitchell and Trudy Cordes to talk to us no, more I'm not, about I'm not crazy, I swear. optical communications, also known as DSOC. So, Jason, how exactly do these laser communications work? But, Jasmine, so uh, just like uh, on Earth where space users are voracious, uh, for data, and so most of that data on Earth is routed through fiber optic cables with lasers, as everybody oh. knows. We do the same thing for space users in this concept for things like DSOC, uh, except can't tether a spacecraft to a fiber, so you have to do a free space link. And with that, there's at least three challenges. There's pointing becomes a challenge, you have to point very precisely, plus the Earth distorts optical light, right? And so you think about a hot road uh, on a, or the horizon of a hot road on a hot day, right? Like today, uh, and you see that shimmer. <laughs> and then three, the signal is so faint, you literally have to count photons. So we have to have these super cooled nanowire up, detectors that are cooled to just about one degree Celsius above absolute zero. But you put that together and we get a capability to deliver data 10 to 100 times faster. Right, so what we're doing is pretty complex. And Trudy, your directorate focuses on future first, technologies. Let me so take a selfie. How can in the future? Right, Jasmine. So as, as Jason said, 10 to 100 times more data we're getting back. So it's very enhancing. For our friends in science, more data means more discoveries. And then certainly, with all the work the agency is doing around Moon to Mars objectives, DSOC now gets into the to Mars part of that. So humans to Mars, a very realistic uh, type of system we could use for reliable infrastructure such as you know, advanced communication systems um, is, is absolutely enabling and um, uh, going to make humans to Mars and exploration a, a possibility. Exactly. I'm glad you mentioned uh, to Mars. Jason, you are uh, understanding, you know, DSOC on a deep level, and actually there will be something called O2O on Orion for Artemis 2. So Morning, how Jess. are they uh, working in tandem? So thank you. So the optical to Orion will be another optical demonstration on, on that vehicle, and um, it will so they're different missions, so they're different implementations, but they do share a lot of I don't mean to interrupt real quick, but also it's really funny to me when scientists get really, really hyped up about what they're saying because they'll end up talking really, really, really freaking fast. Injection or infusion into human spaceflight. Right. And, uh, without fail. Every ask, time, dude. Um, so Jason, every time. A unique opportunity to go over and see O2O uh, installed on the Artemis. Nathan, the side side boosters today. are coming it back. It's their, beautiful. believe it or not, it's their fourth that. flight. Yeah, that's a lot for Falcon for, Heavy boosters. You know, flying that for us to get this to an operational capability. Like, and listen to Judy go. What we like to say in space tech all the time. What do we say, Jason? Technology drives exploration. Bingo. Exactly, exactly. what Jason said. Um, see, see, look at it. Look at them. They're freaking hyped. That's that's my favorite. That's my favorite part. They're freaking super into. I love that. I <laughs> can't get enough of it. <laughs> They're super into it, man. <laughs> it makes me so happy.
Here we go. You would have thought it was launch day here at Kennedy Space Center just a few weeks ago. Slow the down. Oh. Suited up in the historic Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. A test to practice a bit of what would happen Jeremy before hands. they lift off for the moon. What about the center core? It expended for mission oh, performance, are. dudes. Inside their brand new fully electric cruise toasters. transportation vehicles for the nine mile. Those are toasters with wheels. Those are toasters with wheels. No, I will not. I will not stop talking about it. Pilot Victor Glover and mission specialist Christina Cook and Jeremy Hansen took elevators to the top of yeah, the baby. mobile launcher. When we walked out that crew access arm, I just had images of all those Apollo launches and shuttle launches that I saw as a kid, um, and it, it was Jeremy, unreal. I actually had up. to stop and just stand a moment in the crew access arm to really let it all sink in. The day's successful test ended in the White Room, their final stop before boarding the, the Orion patch. capsule to the moon. That's your Artemis Moon Minute. It makes me very happy to see orange flight suits. As a shuttle fanboy, it makes me real happy to see those orange flight suits, man. The canoes are alright, It's but the Airstream reboot was better. I, Raja, I will not, I will not get off this, uh, this ship. Uh, I, I think that the Rivian, the Rivian transport van would have been the best choice. It's a heavy duty electric vehicle. Well, medium duty, we should say. It's not a heavy duty, right? The Rivian transport van would be brilliant for moving crew. It's perfect. It, that, that's what, that's what NASA had used in the past. They used... RVs and airstreams and delivery and basically a milk truck during the Apollo program. Yeah, it would have been perfect for it. Now, here's the thing. I don't hate the canoes. The canoes look like toasters. But also, you know, you know what the canoes would have been good for? Mail vans. Think about it. Think about it. Mail vans. They're perfect for it. Electric vehicle. Simple, modular chassis, and it's a van. Just saying. But why male vans? Are you serious? I just told you that a moment ago. No, not vans down by the river. No, no. They're, they're great light parcel delivery vehicles when you think about it. They're the size of a male van. They're very simple to work on because they're electric, very simple to fix. And canoe is... Canoe has a modular chassis, so the chassis and the it's a body on chassis electric vehicle, so it's really easy to take apart. Just saying. Up, up, up. He's getting hyped. <laughs> and now taking us through the rest of the launch countdown are Daryl and Nick. Thank you, Jim and Megan. Appreciate all the knowledge we are getting about the Psyche Center mission Center core RP1 load is complete. Center core RP1. Call out that the RP1 load is complete, and that's great we should news. Use Harley Davidson's to watch as this vehicle is tanked with propellants, 2.8 million pounds of propellants, both liquid ox oxygen and they refined should, Zymus, kerosene, yeah. called RP1. We've got a number of things that we are going to be looking at as we count down in the final minutes, Mick, and one of them is chilling the booster engines, transitioning the power to internal from shore power on the ground to internal to the rocket and the spacecraft yeah absolutely as we're tanking the launch vehicle there's also I things behind going that on the spacecraft that, and that the spacecraft that, uh, team astronaut is working transport all of their vehicle, ops transitioning guy. to internal power getting ready for this morning's launch probably gonna buy an e-transit just heard they confirmed communication uh with Discovery. the spacecraft no, after, trans after Do a, it, you won't. a short transition and we'll verify that they're on internal power here shortly uh, hey, but things continue PY, for complete. this morning's uh, launch attempt and we're hearing as we go along booster. updates about when each booster's RP-1 is complete. And we will also hear when their LOX is complete. We're getting now down to the final filling. T minus of seven the minutes and counting. Engine chill has started. So another key milestone. Engine engine chill there is thermal conditioning of the 27 Merlin engines that are down at the bottom of the vehicle. There's nine on each core. Nine times three, 27. Basically, that liquid oxygen, once again, you, you do not want to flow really cold liquid oxygen into a, uh, an, a rocket motor that's at ambient temperature. 
what's going to happen is some of that liquid oxygen will basically flash evaporate uh, when it if they just turn the thing on and it would basically be like dry firing the rocket engine which is very very bad for it you don't want to do that you have to get the rocket engines to operating temperature before you start them the rockets are designed to operate at really cold temperatures because the propellants going through the impeller particularly the liquid oxygen is really really cold and if you go from really really hot to really really cold with metal you're, you're asking for problems with the rocket motor. A lot of those parts are engineered to a very specific tolerance. Heck, the rocket motor probably wouldn't even work if it was at ambient temperature. It'll probably just pop, we, which, which is what we don't want to see. So they begin thermally conditioning the rocket engines. They're basically, they basically open up a, a valve, a little pre-valve to each engine, and they're kind of just letting liquid oxygen trickle into the engines. Evaporating means expansion in a small high pressure in small high pressure lines. Yeah, probably not. Yeah, we don't want that. Hey, Ajax, it's six months, buddy. Thank you, thank you guys for coming out. Shot of the rocket Falcon Heavy. Spacecraft is on internal power. Okay. There's the confirmation. The spacecraft is now on internal power. So that's at T minus five minutes. The Psyche spacecraft is now operating off off of its onboard batteries. They disconnected it from the grid. The reason why they do this now is basically checking the power systems on the vehicle to make sure that the batteries are actually doing what you want. You you don't want to get to this point and have a dead battery because you go to launch it and then if if you run out of electrical in a battery down here, you just change the battery or recharge the battery. You can't do that very well when the spacecraft's up there going 20,000 miles an hour on a transfer burn to, to Mars. <laughs> nah. You ain't getting it back once it launches. <laughs> so they switch to internal power, you know, well before the launch to make sure that all electrical systems on board are working correctly and that they got the right voltages. Pole, which is coming up in just a few seconds. A final check with the NASA launch manager. Are we Tim fast Dunn forwarded? We can do that. Launch director Mike Taylor of SpaceX. LD and Liam, countdown net. LD. The NASA psyche team is go for launch. Got to go for launch. Triple check. Did you just make a Falcon Heavy funny? So. NASA's launch load is complete. Stage one, liquid Definitely oxygen load is complete. For a locks load on one of the side boosters is. Okay, prepare to fast forward. Preparing to fast forward. Fast forwarding, sir. Fast forwarding. Transporter erector is retracting into the 89 degree position. This thing, the transporter erector needs to get away from the rocket pretty dang quick. They kind of put it in a staged position here. So when Falcon Heavy launches, the thing's going to spring back and go that way to get away from it. The, the, the thing that comes out of the bottom of this is really damaging. The f fire. That's Yeah, you don't want that. Okay, for that you don't want that near that this equipment. Burn and landing burn. They'll make a sonic run ads. I, I ran ads at the start yeah, of the stream, Linux. We're, we're too close. To two boosters Running back. ads and now will we'll cut into the launch. That center core will be expendable. We'll use all the propellants for Psyche today. And if you look at the launch vehicle, one of springs you back to 45 degrees, beard. Brand new and expendable yeah. is you'll notice there's no grid fit or landing legs on that. The crazy part about that transporter erector, dude, that thing's probably like a thousand tons. And it's a thousand tons that springs back about, about this fast. It's heavy. Launch pad components are really heavy duty because of the shock that they have to endure when the when the happy stuff comes out the bottom of this thing. Has eyes for them, for the Europa Clipper mission. We do actually. The side boosters will be used uh, on a. Uh, load is complete. Still about twenty seconds behind, guys. NASA always staggers their cast by thirty seconds, twenty to thirty seconds. That's done on purpose. Uh. There's the TE purge out. So just like before, when they were pumping lines up, pumping the fuel lines and the oxidizer lines up into the second stage, they're they're getting all of it out. You don't want the rocket igniting residual propellants inside of the transporter erector. That once again causes explosions where you do not want them. So what they're doing is they're venting all the remaining liquid oxygen and purging out the fuel and oxidizer lines on the transporter erector to make sure that nothing ignites on it. The only ignition you want is down there and going in one direction towards the ground. Ground gas closeouts and see that burst of locks coming off the side of the rocket there. That is 
emptying out side boosters are coming back Simon this is their fourth flight or strong back okay 70 seconds out don't bring them up down to the final minute now Rambo all right guys T minus 60 seconds Falcon 9 Falcon heavy is in startup Yep, that's well, that's what I was about to say. I didn't get it didn't in in time. Call out that the Falcon Heavy is in startup. So startup is basically the start of the the navigation software, and basically Falcon Nine right now is going to go through final checks. The computer on board is going to look for any weird anomalous data going through the vehicle. If it doesn't find anything. We're going. Deep spacecraft to deep space. T minus thirty seconds. Thirty seconds. I just said that. Fifteen seconds. And here we go with the final seconds ten. of launch. T minus ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five. Sound suppressor four, system is prime. Three, two, one. Got a good ignition. Engine. Ignition. You gotta be kidding me. There we go. Lift, lift off. off. Psyche. Lift off of Falcon Heavy and Psyche. On a mission to a metal 20 minutes past the hour, we got a lift off. To study the building blocks of our planet's inner space. Vehicles pitching gun range. That's nice. Into the clouds. M1D yep. chamber pressure is nominal. Okay. This is a shot on board looking down at the top of one of the boosters. Shot there as it goes through the clouds. Oh, that noise though. Very nice. Stand by for the call for power and telemetry. Vehicles rolling to the proper flight azimuth for precise parking orbit insertion. Power and telemetry nominal. We've got a good call on the power and telemetry. Here we hear Joe, the power telemetry nominal. We're also looking at the data for all 27 engines. Falcon is also. supersonic. All okay. chamber pressures look we are good faster than the speed solid. of sound now. Throttling down in preparation for max Q. Engines will enter the throttle bucket in, uh, in preparation for maximum dynamic pressure, where, which is peak structural aerodynamic load on the vehicle. At max Q, the rocket basically slows down because you're still in the atmosphere. Now, it's the job of those three boosters to get to get that thing going fast. To get that, we'll get it going up. It's the job of the second stage to get it to go fast. But there's only a point where you can. There's only so much. Oh, what a shot! There's only there's only so much. So you can only go so fast before you just can't move the air out of the way fast enough that's in the atmosphere. So what they do is they throttle the engines down. It's called the throttle bucket. The reason why it's called the throttle bucket is because if you're looking at a graph that's reporting the thrust data on the engines, right, the engines will throttle down and then they'll throttle up again. It looks like a bucket. I know. Engineers. Very, very creative names. So we should be past max Q here, getting to booster separation within the next 20 seconds. All 27 engines of the Falcon Heavy putting down 5.1 million pounds of thrust. Beast mode. Look Standing at that by now for rocket, booster dude. engine cutoff for those side boosters. The center core booster will continue on. Should be getting to Biko here. Booster engine cutoff. There it booster is. Booster engine cutoff. Separation confirmed. Side booster separation confirmed. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. That's killer. The side boosters coming off the rocket. MVAC engine chill has started. Now, cold gas thrusters on those two chill, boosters two, will actually start to turn around, the, uh, and they're Mika coming back. On the center core, back stage, stage two will continue uh, chilling down, making sure the fuel and propellants are flowing through that MVAC, getting ready for ignition. They're thermally conditioning the second stage engine to make sure that the, it's also cold enough to be able to handle the liquid oxygen. That's what that's what MVAC chill is. LZ1 and LZ2, landing zone one and two here at the Cape. Now, once again, that center core and the upper stage are going to be expended because of performance for the mission. Psyche Except isn't a particular cut off of that center. Psyche is not particularly a big satellite, but it needs to go very, very far. So you need a big rocket to launch a small payload really, really far. So in order to get that performance that that Psyche needs to get out to the 
well, Psyche, <laughs> the Psyche mission needs to get out to the Psyche asteroid. They're going to expend the center core. As the announcers were talking about it a little bit earlier, no grid fins, no landing legs on that center core, leaving a very weird looking Fal Falcon Heavy, but yeah, still cool. It's the most powerful launch vehicle flying right now. Well, operational launch vehicle flying. Starship, Starship flew and it had more power, even with all of its engines out, but... Uh -oh. And then SLS too, but stage separation confirmed. Okay, good staging. And there it goes. You're looking at the second stage in front of you, lighting up. Exactly. Like so we got an upper stage ignition right there. Everything's looking good. Those lines, if you're wondering, so that that rod in the center is a pneumatic push rod. That's designed to make sure that the nozzle it 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 has like a a rubber gasket up at the top. It's designed to make sure that gigantic Merlin vacuum nozzle doesn't actually hit the sides of the inner stage. The inner stage is the structural housing that mates the second stage in the uh, the core stage and the second stage. There's a good fairing separation, and that that nozzle in reality is probably about ten to twelve feet tall. It doesn't look that big on camera, but you could stand inside of it easy. It's gigantic, and the thing is, if you if you're really keen on, you can look at the edge of that nozzle. It does oscillate around, and you don't want that oscillation happening during stage separation. So that rod in the center actually keeps the vehicle centered as it pushes it away from that center core. And those vent lines on the sides are the vent lines from the thermal conditioning, right? You could see where they were attached. One, two, and there's another one that's behind the foil that you can't see. See the vent lines right there? Those lines were used to thermally condition the engine. They're also used for engine purging on the second stage. This mission is going to call for two upper stage burns, Seco 1 and Seco 2, or, well, SES 1 and SES 2. We're at second, we're at second stage engine start 1, we already entered that. Then we have second stage engine cut off here, but after that, they're going to basically get to the other side of the planet, and they're going to fire, because that's going to get you on the right trajectory to get out to Mars to do a grab assist, right? So, at second stage engine start 2, they're going to have to start thermally conditioning the engine again. But, at Seco 1, they purge the engine out. The reason why they purge the engine out and they don't just leave the propellants in there is because there's a lot of there's a lot of metallic components on a rocket engine that you don't want rusting. And liquid oxygen, you if you live in the salt belt like me, you think salt is bad? Liquid oxygen really rusts things. So they purge the engine out with helium, and that's what those vent lines are used for. They're used for thermal conditioning and engine purging. Second stage. To make sure that every single ignition of that engine yeah, all, is exactly the, the same. So far, uh, telemetry is looking nominal. Um, I see the telemetry uh, chilling down the engines for that uh, <coughs> booster entry burn. We've got a on track the on the double uh, starting up in the telemetry. side cores here. There we go. Th those little puffs you're seeing are the nitrogen attitude control thrusters. Basically, they're at the inside of the nose cone of each one of those side boosters. There's gigantic nitrogen tanks, and they shoot nitrogen out the sides to get the booster to fly business end first. For my favorite part, uh, the boosters will then do an entry burn here momentarily, and the entry burn is basically designed to slow the booster down. There it is, one engine, three engines. Right, what that's doing there is slowing Falcon 9 down, but it's also protecting it from reentry. I will never stop talking about this because I think it's the coolest thing ever. Oh, look at that condensation effects from hitting the atmosphere because it's super humid. You see that big? You see that big cloud? That's awesome. That right there, that burn you saw, is called supersonic retropropulsion. The gases coming out of the engine actually shield the booster. That's the heat shield. Oh, what a shot! Come on, get the focus, dude. There, and each booster goes through it, and that's actually what shields Falcon 9. It doesn't even have... It has some thermal protection on the bottom, but no heat shield like you'd see, like, tiles or anything. The engine's firing is the heat shield. Look at that shot, man! Sonic booms, baby! Okay, landing burn has started. First booster coming down. Landing leg deploy. Second one should be staggered right behind it. I don't know. Daryl, but that uh, that sonic boom was great for us. I'm sure Jim is excited over there. There's the oh, second. Oh yeah. I'm sure the host desk over there is feeling that really well. Literally Two on the pads, ready to go. Yep. We'd be fast. Both those boosters and they'd be slow. The sound barrier. 
and we just heard Booster Land. That's confirmed. awesome. That Jack never gets old, man. Bump, bump, That's so Jack freaking cool. One and two, everything <laughs> looks great. And then the call out for stage two FTS is safe. Eco one, stage two engine cutoff. See. So, Daryl, this will put us... There we go. We have Seco 1, and they didn't update... They haven't updated their UI yet. There we go. Seco 1. If you noticed, at second stage engine cutoff, those little vent lines started going bananas because they're pumping helium through the plumbing on the Merlin vacuum engine to get all that gaseous oxygen and residual RP-1 out of the system. It's funny because when that... When it actually when the gaseous oxygen actually ends up hitting the vacuum, right? It ha you experience an insane pressure drop and that actually ends up solidifying the oxygen because for that split second, the temperature goes all the way down to absolute zero. And once you hit absolute zero, ab absolute zero is not a temperature. It's nothing. <laughs> it's not a temperature. It's not hot or cold. It's nothing. That's, that's an important thing to understand with temperature. So, but in that split second where all what any potential heat that's inside of that oxygen gets completely sucked out by the vacuum, right? You get solidification. So on the edge of the vent lines, you, you often see snowflakes, but it's not, it's not, it's not ice. <laughs> it's solid oxygen. Yes. Solid oxygen. Pretty cool. You heard the sonic boom before port. I, I saw the first Falcon heavy flight. I was one of the first ones to hear double sonic booms from two boosters landing. What is the foil for on the second stage engine? Good question, Flyboy. It's thermal. It's for thermal purposes that because once again, it's really so believe it or not, everybody says space is cold. Space isn't cold. Like I said, it's nothing. Nothing. That's really important to understand. It is nothing. There's nothing up there. It's a vacuum. There's nothing. There's no heat. In fact, it's the absence of heat, the complete absence of heat. The thing is, it's really easy for a spacecraft to overheat. Now, why? Why? What do you mean overheat? I thought you just, didn't you just say that space is nothing? Why would heat be a problem? Well, there's that damn thing called the sun up there. That's, and the sun, the spacecraft will absorb the light and that light will, and spacecrafts are made out of metal. They absorb the heat really, really well. And on top of that, there's onboard systems like computers and stuff. I don't know if you guys, you know, have some crazy overclocked rig or something. They, they make a lot of heat. Yeah, they make a lot of heat. So you got to find, you actually, spacecraft actually, if you didn't have some type of coolant system on board, they would actually melt in space, despite space being nothing. They would melt. You don't want that. So that, that thermal insulation there is to actually, believe it or not, insulate the turbine machinery on the Merlin engine to make sure that it doesn't overheat in the sun. It's a, it's a thermal blanket. The space blanket. Yeah. SpaceX has gotten really good at doing that over the years. Back in the day, you know, 10, 15 years ago, they just duct taped some trash bags to the turbine machinery. Not kidding. Hey, space, SpaceX wasn't always as crazy, you know. I mean, they're still, still, they're still crazy. Let's be real. They're still crazy. But they were... Hey, if you didn't have the money for the Mylar app, glue some trash... Tape some trash bags to the side. That's what they used to do. Like, this was a long time ago. They haven't done that in years. <laughs> Do you think that's how they clean the landing pad? Maybe. Minus 70C to 100. Yep. Mm -hmm. Multi-layer insulation. Yep. Do they intentionally steer the two boosters away from each other? Self-synthesis, I've noticed that their trajectory opt uh, optimizations for Falcon Heavy, as we see more of them, they, they tend to stagger the boosters, like, a lot. The first Falcon Heavy had the two boosters landing almost simultaneously. But they obviously don't now, right? <laughs> uh, real quick, so we're at T-plus almost 13 minutes here. Stage two seems pretty dang healthy and it's on the, it's on a, the, it's on pretty much a nominal trajectory out over the middle of the Atlantic right now. Uh, it's going to be, we're going to be in a little bit of a coast for about 45 minutes here or well, the next, let's go, let's say 37 minutes. We're in a coast until second stage engines start. But anyway, um, self-synthesis, if I had to guess, right, if I had to guess the reason there's a reason why they stagger the boosters. It's some type of trajectory optimization. So, you know, 
EJ, you big, use big words. What does that mean? What does that mean in plain English? So, let's see. They wouldn't... Why would you... Let's think about this for a second. Once again, this is one of those things that... I don't know the exact answer. I have no idea. But we can kind of, you know, connect some dots there. But we're not going to... We're never going to... I don't know the exact reason. But it's. I think it's reasonable to guess. Like, okay, so clearly... The boosters are landing simultaneously, and now they're not. So there's something going on there with interaction between the boosters that, that causes SpaceX to stagger those landings. There's something. They figured out something. They figured out that they, both of them firing next to each other is probably not, not good for them. Sound can damage rockets. It's very, very well documented. I'll give you an example. STS-1, the first space shuttle flight, April 12th, 1981. They they launched the space shuttle and the, the solid rocket boosters actually performed better than they expected. They made more thrust than what they thought. Not much. Mission went up into space just fine. But because they didn't anticipate that booster overperformance, when the solid rocket boosters ignited and the space shuttle in Columbia took off, the sounds from that overperformance of the boosters was so ridiculously violent that they reverbed off the deck of the launch pad and damaged Columbia on the way up. The, the vibrations were so bad from the reverbed sound that tiles were coming off the back of the shuttle. Crazy, right? So, so that's well documented that when rockets are operating near the ground, sound reverberates and it damages things. That's very well, that, that we knew that. That's why they spray a ton of water on the top of the pad when the rocket launches so the rocket won't destroy itself when it's near the ground. Because a rocket like Falcon Heavy, it absolutely would. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that absolutely would get... Yeah, firing that into a dry flame trench is probably not a good idea. Now, it was, the center stage was expended for, for performance spaghetti. They, the center core, it sucks. It really, it really is annoying that Falcon Heavy missions keep having expendable center cores. But hey, I'll take booster. I'll take the side booster reuse. That's fine. So, if I had to guess, self, that's the reason why they're staggering the landings. It has to. It has something to do with acoustics. That's that's a guess. You know, the typical Jack Ryan, Alec Baldwin. Oh, that was a guess, but it seemed logical. How did you know that a reactor leak was a false? You'll shit here, rightful rudder, bearing 315. I can't pilot a submarine. I'm with the CIA. CIA. Shit here, then. That makes the most sense. Doubt they affect each other much in flight. Exactly. It's it's really about being near the ground self-synthesis. There's some... I'll bet you it's some type of acoustic thing. Probably... It was probably damaging e the boosters in some way. So they stagger the landings. Now, once again, nothing is by accident in this industry unless you see people in mission control doing this. And if you look at, if you look at a shot of JPL, I, okay, I don't see many people doing, doing this. If people in mission control are doing the twitchy mode, not like this, you got a big problem, but I don't see anybody doing that. So nothing is by accident here. Meaning that those boosters were staggered. That trajectory optimization was staggered for a reason. If you, if you hear lock the doors, stuff went wrong. That dude, that still haunts me, Kicks. I hate seeing spacecraft fail. It really, It's the worst feeling ever. Now, like, if you don't know me, guys, like, I don't have any experience out in the real aerospace industry, right? But I do play a lot of KSP, and I know people just tout that around like, oh, well, I played Kerbal. I could work for NASA. No, no. I have 20,000 hours in KSP, and I would not work for NASA. Absolutely not. I don't know enough. Right? I know enough to be dangerous, but not enough to work for these guys, right? Like, but here's the thing. I do big, gigantic pro projects in KSP, right? Projects that take months of planning, months of engineering, and months of organization. I've had those things blow up in my face before because I forgot. I, I did a Michael Bolton and forgot some mundane detail. And I'll tell you, seeing an eight-month project quite literally go up in smoke or a project that I've been working on for like a year in Kerbal, seeing it go up in smoke really sucks. It's not a good feeling. If it if it sucks in KSP and it's the worst feeling ever, I can't even imagine what it's like if your spacecraft doesn't work. 
in real life. That's probably, dude. I think I would rather be punched in the stomach. Like, repeatedly. Like, boom, boom, boom. Like, a couple uppercuts right to the gut. I'd, I'd think I'd rather have that. Because at least that, at least that, that pain doesn't go away. <laughs> I mean, that pain goes away. The, the freaking, uh, the pain of failure is terrible. Not only, not only, you know, it's expensive, yeah. Hey, peace and love. I don't mind you saying it once. Please don't spam my chat, dude. Peace and love, absolutely. And, you know, you're good. Take it down just a little bit. <laughs> Okay, just once. Once I'm totally cool with. Don't don't spam it in the chat. Not because of, like I don't want peace or anything. It's harder for me to read. <laughs> I I too want world peace. We should be doing more of this. This is more. This is cooler. I'll always say, dudes, and I've been saying this on stream for years. It's easy to blow stuff up. It's easy to destroy things. And sometimes, you know, not justifying war. War is terrible. Straight up, don't like it. I like the technology from it, but it's easier to destroy things. It takes skill to build things. Think about it. I was always nervous until the second stage fire ends. And Dreja keeps tell telling me that whenever I'm building an outpost. It takes skill to build things. It takes skill to do stuff like this. Anybody can break something. Anyone can blow something up. It takes skill to make it work. Think about it. Yeah, Deadly, it's... Yeah. Dude, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, man. If Kerbal is any indication of how complicated this this is... Like, even if it's, like, 1% accurate to how... 1% accurate to, like, how real life works. Oh, oh my... Oh my goodness, the complexity here is incomprehensible to most. <laughs> that's why you always say space is hard. Yeah, Stellar, that's true. I don't like throwing that phrase around, dude, because I think people use it as a catch-all for justification for not understanding what they're talking about. I always like to say why space is hard. That's why I talk about propellant conditioning when on the vehicle, supersonic retropropulsion, uh, trajectory optimizations. Uh, I always say, I always try to tell people why. I always try to convey that. You know, I try to get that incomprehensible factor of difficulty and try to explain it to people. Yeah, yeah, Kix, I got you. Can you explain to me what lock the doors means? Um... It basically, they want to preserve all telemetry for the investigation, so they lock the doors. Nobody in or out of mission control and make sure that everybody stays at their station so they can correctly record all the parameters to figure out what went wrong. It's part of fault tree analysis, Kicks. We got training on that stuff because you have to explain astronautics at a fifth grade level. Yeah. Stellar, I I'll be honest. Yeah, I, I understand the fifth grade level. NASA's all about explaining at a middle school, elementary school level. I try to... I try to explain stuff at a high school level. I I try to I try to explain stuff at a, a little bit higher than that. I find that if you just keep it enough if you keep like so like use the actual terms of how stuff is like, you know, apogee, perigee, use prograde, retrograde, coplanar normal, coplanar antinormal, radial in, radial out. You, Use some of the big words, but don't use all of the big words. That's kind of my blend right there. Because I find that if you're... When I was younger, dude, and I wanted to learn something, right? I didn't want dumbed down. Even like 13, 14, 15-year-old me, I didn't want a dumbed down explanation. I wanted to know actually how it worked. That's a picture of Psyche. It's basically a gigantic flying server rack. With a bunch of instrumentation attached to it. But anyway... Uh, I wanted I wanted to know that the specifics, you know, I think that that's a way to figure out if people have the drive, the drive for spaceflight. You, because Stellar, you you know good and well you can't just like this stuff. You have to really really like it because it's the path is very long. It's very tedious. It's very annoying. It's it's a big struggle <laughs> trying to do anything in this industry because it's so ridiculously complicated. 
I find that I, I try to, I, I aim for high school with my explanations because most people have gone through high school or at least gotten, you know, some type of equivalency to that, right? And um, if, if I was younger, you know, if I was 13, 14, 15 getting into space flight right now, I wouldn't want kids stuff. That's not what preteens and teenagers want. They don't want kids stuff. They want to be like, I wanted to know everything. I wanted to, when I was younger, I want to know everything about the space shuttle, right? I still don't know everything about the space shuttle, but I'm trying. I want to know everything. So I kind of keep it at a high school level. So if you're, you know, if kids are watching the stream and they're a go-getter and they want to understand this, they'll get to that high school level before high school. And I think that's good development that way, you know. I, yes, I think about all of this every time I do an explanation. How many bolts are on the shuttle payload bay doors? Bolts. Uh, Flyken, is there context to that question? What do you mean? There's there's tons of bolts on them. Would like are you talking about a specific component or what? Counterpoint, the barrier of entry needs to be low enough to not discourage people at the start of their journey. That's why I blend, theoretically. I don't teach at a high school level. I teach at almost a high school level. But it's like a shade above NASA. NASA is like, the way they do explanations is like, the spacecraft will ignite its engines and blast off into space. And it needs to be going fast. Like, if I was 13 and I heard that, and I heard somebody that's trying to get you involved with space flight, and I heard somebody say that, I would not want to do it. I'd be like, I'm not, I'm not eight, I'm 13. Please don't talk to me that way. So I don't. Teaching at streamer level. Ah, uh, fair. I missed the comparison to NASA level. I'm with you. Yeah, that was the context of that conversation. That's why I still do analogies. But I do use the, I do use the right terms, you know. Apahelion, perihelion, e vernal equinox, you know, line of apsides, if we're talking orbital mechanics, line of nodes. I'll still use the actual terminology, but I'll come up with good analogies for it to... I don't dumb it down, I just find a way to explain it better, <laughs> you know? Uh, I don't like teaching at a fifth grade level, because I I think that insults viewers' intelligence. Because the, the premise of this is that not everyone can do it, because it's really freaking difficult right? <laughs> so I'm not trying to sit here and eliminate go-getters. If you, you're confident and you want to learn this stuff, you're going to do it. You're just going to do it without even thinking about it, right? I mean, X, I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, you, you doing teaching and stuff in the past, and I think you still do, right? You, you know what I'm talking about. If, if there's a kid that's super involved in it and super into it, They'll, they'll learn it. They'll learn it faster than others. We got double booster landings, John. Absolutely. And we're getting some live shots from Psyche here. There we go. Do you think they actually... Do you think an actual ton of screws and bolts? Something like that. Are double booster landings ever going to get old? Nah, absolutely not, Murdoch. I don't even think single booster landings get old, man. I still... Guys, I don't... The, the, the Starlink missions get done really, really late. So, and, you know, people are kind of bored of them, which I still am having trouble reconciling that. Uh, like, people are, think that Starlink missions are actually... That rocket launches are actually boring. Like, coming up in the shuttle era when shuttle launches were such a big deal, it still is kind of weird to me. I'm, I'm never going to be able to... That's never going to sit right with me. <laughs> like, wait, what? What do you mean you're bored? What are you, nuts? But e even the, the, the launches that I don't cover here, I still watch them. I watch them the next day. <laughs> I still watch them. Every single one, man. The boosters are back down, Bettle. They've been down for probably about 20 minutes. Oh, Stella, you're talking about the shuttle trainer aircraft. Yeah, it has half shuttle flight deck, half Gulfstream flight deck. I'm not bored. I just wish they'd send them north again so uh, you could see them. Yeah, you and me both, dude. 
they really like flying that southeast trajectory because I I guess the the seas down there are a lot more fair than they are in the North Atlantic, John, which that reads Where would we be today if NASA could have launched the shuttle with the same cadence SpaceX is launching Falcon 9? Oh, I don't know, man. I'll tell you, a shuttle building a Starlink network would be really, really good. Shuttle could do it. It could do it. Those Vandenberg launches would get a little complicated. Those Vandenberg once around launches, but the shuttle could have built Starlink. Easily. Easily built Starlink. It would take a while to ramp the cadence on a vehicle that complex, but if you had the production and supply chains behind you, sure, why not? I mean, the shuttle could probably move more than a Falcon 9. The shuttle can move more than a Falcon 9. Lopsided Goat, I'm 28 and have learned more about rocketry space from the stream in like four years than all through school. Your drive passion and knowledge is definitely infectious. Keep up the good work. Thanks, dude. My pleasure. That's Goat, those are the best comments. I love reading those comments, man. It makes me very happy. It's affirmation that I'm not totally screwing up, you know? <laughs> uh, laugh, but you know what I mean. Repo, so as the mayor of space said, I was jokingly quizzing you on your shuttle knowledge. Oh, uh, okay. How many bolts are there? Yes. Discovery. Like I said, I don't know everything, man. Jeez. Hey. Laws give this up a lopsided. Thank you. Does this announcement mean SLS will have a higher launch cadence? I think they're... Aerodite have always said that SLS is going to ramp to... They're going to try to ramp to four launches a year. Now, how they do that, the OIG seems to have a problem with, but... You're an idiot. I mean, tell me something I don't know, dude. Jeez. I'm excited about the second study of microbes growing on the exterior of the ISS. Oh, really? How is that possible? Huh. Oh, yes. If they could land the orange tank, it would be huge. <laughs> Landing the ET would be great, but, I mean, John, the ET gets 98% of the way to space. Putting a thermal protection system on it would screw your mass fraction on the external tank and probably end up having the shuttle's payload capacity to space. Straight up. Um, at the very least, that's a gross, like, underestimation if I'm, if I'm thinking about the math correctly. Because you got to think about it. The external tank and the space shuttle are the upper stage. And you already have a terrible mass fraction with that. The reason why you have a terrible mass fraction with it is because you need a lot of components for the shuttle to actually, you know, come back down. It's already the shuttle's thermal protection system. Shuttle's control surfaces. Uh, you know, all the control systems. All, you know, all the things that you need to bring a spacecraft back down. The shuttle is already taking up a ton of that, ton of that mass. So... When I'm talking about mass fraction, guys, I mean how much fuel is on it and how much rocket is on it. How much spacecraft is on your spacecraft, how much fuel is on your spacecraft. This is a plain English way of explaining the delta V formula. So the delta V formula, basically change in velocity formula or the ideal rocket equation, basically says that in plain English. How fast are you shooting gas out the back? All right. How much, of, how much propellants do you have and how much spacecraft do you have? The ratio of spacecraft to propellant is called a mass fraction, okay? The higher that mass, or the lower that mass fraction, excuse me, the more spacecraft, most space, like, rockets that are flying today are like 98% fuel and like 2% spacecraft. The shuttle was way higher than that because you're bringing back a 737-sized spacecraft, right? So... Adding all that stuff to the external tank would screw your mass fraction on the second stage to the point where, John, I'm not even sure the shuttle would, even with no payload, I'm not sure it would have enough delta V to get into space. The other thing is that the external tanks for the space shuttle are ridiculously simplified compared to fuel tanks on like a Falcon 9 or an Atlas V, for instance. Ironic because Atlas, Falcon... They all borrowed, basically, at that time, when they were engineered, they borrowed industry standards, aerospace industry standards for building tankage that was pioneered from the external tank. Because, John, they were always trying to squeeze more mass out of that, out of that tank. They were always trying to increase or decrease the mass fraction on, on the tank. Basically, you're trying to get the tank lighter all the time because it, lightening that tank even by, like, a 1,000 pounds would add a good amount of payload capacity to the space shuttle. 
KSP after this? Apps a freaking lootly, man. I watched it from the beach. It was amazing and very bright. You see the two boosters come down, Sawyer? They staggered the landings, which is pretty pretty sweet. The shuttle could in fact take the external tank all the way to orbit. Yeah, well of course, Sinerd. I really wish they I really wish they had I really wish they had done some of that. I think the aft cargo carrier proposal for the space shuttle is genius. They should have done that. What T plus is second stage engine start to? Uh, about 15 minutes. Yeah, Sinerd, with the aft cargo carrier and stuff, you yeah, you, you would take, once again, you'd take a payload hit. But it would be, John, I mean, I get what you're saying. You know, I, I still don't like the idea of throwing rockets away in 2023. I think that's ridiculous. But also at the same time, I know how complicated it is to bring stuff back. It's, that's not an easy thing to do. It was cloudy, Sawyer. Well, you heard it though. You heard that rumble, dude. Love that, love that noise. You use just enough big words to get people curious. If that curiosity is serious, they will get into space flight. Bingo. Yep. Well, Vanguard, yeah, the reason why I do that is because space is inherently mysterious. It's something to get people to wonder about stuff. I try, I try to tailor my explanations in a way that gets, that kindles kindles that basically stokes uh, that stokes that flame that's i'm very very careful about doing this this way I, I i try to i try to and the other thing is that i try to get to know you guys at least a little bit like at least know where you're from so i can come up with an analogy that people can understand because and the reason why i'm so heavy and he, so heavily emphasized on analogies in the first place is because and if you can figure out some way for a person to connect a neuron in their brain. So if they can find a way to relate to source material, you'll understand it better and it'll click. You'll unlock stuff up here that you didn't know you had. And that's what I try to do with every single explanation. I've been doing it for a decade. I do it every day, hundreds of explanations every day. I, that's what we do. I'm very careful about this stuff. You've been stoking my flame for years. Okay. Okay. Finish my comment. Keep doing what you're doing. Blends perfect. All right. Your feedback is appreciated. It's every day, bro, with that Disney Channel flow. PewDiePie is next. Yeah. I'll take statements that aged poorly, Mayor. Ooh. Cad drawings. It's the gamma ray spectrometer and the other one is the neutron spectrometer. Both combined study the elemental composition of Psyche. If you know the surface composition, what it's made of in terms of iron and nickel and silicon and oxygen, you can then start to say something about its history and how it formed and how it evolved. By using gamma ray spectroscopy, it's going to take some time, Tigris. Measure those elements. Two billion miles. It has to grab assist off Mars, to so it's going to it's going to be a little bit. It's going to be a little while. Surface. For Psyche, we're building kind of what we call the Cadillac. It's a very high precision, high sensitivity. Friend of monkeys, I wasn't interested in space stuff until Bob and Doug went up. It was always explained like I was five or I had a PhD. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. See that? Yeah. There you go. I'm glad you appreciate it, man. Is that a Delta II? Blast from the past, man. It'll arrive in 2029. There you go. Our instrument is kind of like a camera without a telephoto lens. In order to get our best measurements, we need to be relatively... I'm just glad they found that SW bug early. Right, Stellar? Yeah. Psyche had some problems with its thrusters. <laughs> like... In the last in the cup in the last couple of weeks, I didn't I actually didn't get a chance to cover this during Space News. Psyche had some problems with its thrusters not working correctly, and they had to they basically had to patch the thing when it was in the payload integration uh, building. <laughs> That's not really where you should be doing that ideally, but then again, you're always going to get a curveball with spaceflight. Yeah, <laughs> they were like, "Hey guys, the thrusters don't work." What? <laughs> yeah. Th the thrusters don't work. We should, we should fix that. Yes. 
Yes, we should. Born too late for the space race and too early for everyday space travel. Moose, I, I understand the sentiment for sure, but I, to be honest with you, man, I hate that term. Oh, well, it's born, born too early, to, born too late to explore the world, born too early to explore space. Well, here's the thing about that, man. A, this stuff doesn't happen overnight, and that's the whole premise of that statement. But B, you want to make space travel routine, throw your hat into the ring, Right? Look at where we've gone with space travel in the last 10 years. 10 years ago at this time, you maybe saw a rocket flying out of the Cape Couple every couple of months, one to two months, even SpaceX, one to two months. Maybe a Dragon mission, and then a geosatellite every once in a while. Nowadays, we're sub-four-day launch. Sub-four-day launch at the Cape. Meaning a rocket goes out of the Cape every four freaking days, more than once a week which is absurd. So, like, I, I never really liked that statement because look at what we're doing, man. There are people out there that are trying to trying to get us to explore the stars faster. Let's get on that train, man. Punch that ticket, get on that train. It's time to wake up. Yeah, virtual. Yeah, Psyche is a protocore. It's a protoplanet, meaning that metallic asteroids could, because they're made out of dense metals, right? I mean, this happens over billions of freaking years, but, you know, because it's so dense, it has gravitational pull. And it's going to pull more, more asteroids and all kinds of other things, you know, comets and whatever. It, it, like, it could be a comet, it could be anything, right? That dense metal core is going to have more gravitational pull than everything else. So it's going to perturb stuff that's around it, right? And it's going to pull all that stuff in. And when it pulls all that stuff in, and stuff constantly crashes into that metallic core, the metallic core heats up. When it heats up, right, you start to get a, you start to get a planet core kind of doing its thing, and it'll just keep pulling more and more matter in, right? Well, not matter, more and more mass in until you eventually get a planet. The, part of the reason why NASA chose Psyche is because they think that Earth started that way. I mean, that was... A little while ago. <laughs> not like, you know, like a little while ago for us. It's not like this happened in 1993 or something. This was a couple billion years ago. But they think Psyche is, has tons of metals on it. It's a metallic asteroid. They know that from looking at the dang thing. From far away, though, right? But they think that NASA has a theory that that's, it's a protocore. It's a protoplanet. Like, this is how planetary formation happens, which is really cool. It's not a rubble pile. Yep. It's finally launching. Oh, it's it's launched already. It was alive in 93. Can confirm. <laughs> Earth was already formed by that point. Oh, well, there you go. Primary source. Shoot, I missed the launch by, like, all the time. What did they send to space today? Oh, Badger. Great mission here. This is the Psyche mission. Psyche was a Falcon Heavy launch, and they landed the they landed the booster cores. The side boosters came back. Center core was expended. That was the fourth flight for those center core... For the side boosters. That was the first flight for the center core. Excuse me. Um, Psyche... The Psyche mission is going to the asteroid Psyche, which is... It's a good ways away. Nice drawing. What, what formulas are those? Huh. Those are... I think those... I think they just wrote down... They googled math formulas and just wrote it down. That's a cool one. I like that picture. Starfield. Starfield. Starfield style, dude. Um, Psyche is a, is a metallic asteroid that's floating out... It's... Uh, hold on. I just gotta remember where it is. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes sometimes I don't know it off the top of my head. Sorry, fellas. Psyche has an irregular potato-like shape. My life is potato. If it were sliced in half horizontally at the equa equator, picture a squished oval, it would measure 173 miles. 
across at its widest point and 144 miles long. Oh, that's like, that's, that's not small. Its surface area is 64,000 square miles or 165,000 kilometers. Yeah, where is it? Yeah, see, this is like a proto, it's a planet core. And obviously, see, see what I mean? These metallic asteroids, see all the craters? Because they're made out of denser materials than say like something that's made out of like iron sulfides or something. This is like straight iron and nickel and stuff from what they, from, from, from I think from what they said. It has more density. So that, that mass is a lot denser. So per Einstein's formula, per Einstein's relativity, you, you, it has more gravitational pull. So these these metallic asteroids pull a lot of stuff in. That's why this thing looks like looks like my face in freaking middle school. It looks it's got pizza face going on. And clearly something big hit this thing at some point. Like I mean I'm not sure if you can tell right there. It's kind of something hit it. But how NASA thinks how planetary formation happens is that these big dense asteroids have more gravitational pull and they pull stuff in. And when they pull stuff in, they end up heating up the core and that core pulls more stuff in, right? Because it has more energy. It pulls more stuff in. And then eventually you get a planet. Eventually. It'll buff, yeah, it'll buff out. I mean, if it's a planet core, it's going to melt it. And then, you know, when it melts, it'll go spherical. And then that's, you know, it'll keep pulling stuff in. They think that's how Earth formed. Can you put 177 miles into perspective, please? I can't imagine this thing being bigger than a minivan with the graphics. Sure. hundred and seventy seven miles, dude, is uh This is just eyeballing it, probably the size of Haiti in the Dominican Republic, something like that. Here, let's let's measure. Uh, nope, little bit, little bit uh, smaller than that. So Puerto Rico. <laughs> Anything but the metric system, Flacken, right? So Psyche is roughly a little bit bigger than Puerto Rico. It is like 1.2 Puerto Rico's big. Yep. Anything but the metric system. Metric is better. Mind your own business. I think Philly to New York is that far, if I'm remembering correctly. Actually, yeah. No, less than that. Philly to you know, New York to Baltimore? Yeah, there you go. Actually, it's about one New Jersey wide. Or one New Jersey long. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Cool. Neat. It is one New Jersey. Actually, it's... I mean, how, how far across am I? Yeah, 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 yeah. Or about one Massachusetts wide. It would take a while to go from one side to the other, dude. If you had some type of car. I mean, we should do that. Just saying. We should probably put... That'd be cool to put a rover on it. But, see, the thing is, like... Even something that freaking big has, like... Minuscule amounts of gravitational pull. Uh, because, once again, it has to do with the, the, ma the density of the mass of the asteroid... You know, like something, even something that's that big, really, 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 really minuscule amounts of gravity. I mean, it is metal, so it probably has more than like a asteroid that's made out of like rocks of that size because metal is super dense like me. But um, yeah, pretty, pretty big, dude. Pretty big. I mean, the thing is, is that Psyche is way smaller than like the Earth's core. The Earth's core is gigantic. It's... It's way bigger than that. The Earth's core is like the size of the entire U.S., dude. It's freaking huge. Like if you if you put like the 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 diameter of it. Yeah, the thing the the molten molten ball of iron and nickel at the center of this planet is um so one very very hot two very very big. It's because this planet's freaking big. The funny thing is is that this, you know, you said the planet's big, but everything in space is relative. That's why Einstein did that whole thing. Uh, Earth's actually a tiny freaking planet compared to some of the other planets in the solar system. It's not very big. Like Jupiter. I mean, Jupiter is a gas giant, so it's a little bit different. So Jupiter is a 
similar similar idea. You have a you have a planet core, and instead of pulling in like other solids, it just pulled in a bunch of gas, and it's just a bunch of gas floating around a, a planet core. It's a gas. That's what that's what a gas giant is, which is that's weird. How did that happen? Some, some forces that are way stronger than any comprehensible thing that our brain can understand. <laughs> it's true. So, we should be coming up here on second stage engine start momentarily. They, it should be happening sometime soon here. Because at that point in the solar system is where gas accumulates, denser stuff accumulates closer to the star. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah, that's also you got to take into account that there's this big molten ball of plasma at the center of our solar system. Yep, yeah, up yeah, oh, there you go. Psyche's gonna grav assist off Mars. See that? Uh, Mars grav assist with if that trajectory was any indication, or if that animation was any indication of the actual trajectory. Yeah, it's 2029. It's gonna take a little bit of time to get there. It's a low energy transfer. Hey Vulcan, 46 months, a bunch of months and a big old launch. Count me in for a good day. Are you going to play a game? We're playing Kerbal today, dude. Gotta play Kerbal. Gotta play Kerbal. What do you got, Mr. Newsom? Yeah. No, 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 no. Not save image. I want to see. Oh, oh, yeah. Very, very good. Very good. Hmm. I'm actually going to turn the audio on here so I can make sure we don't miss the second stage engine start. Hmm. Yeah, this is a good picture. What's the fastest grab assist ever in history, like the speed gain from a grab assist? Parker's solar probe did a grab assist flykin that accelerated it to 440,000 miles an hour. Imagine that in the time it takes Psyche to get there, we develop a way to beat it, and we would get to see its arrival. That'd be pretty cool, Crazy Razor. Yeah, Parker Solar, man. It did a grab assist off of Venus, if I'm remembering right. It did a grab assist off of Venus that gave it relative to like a solar orbit. It gave it a, a radial in component. Basically, they launched it heading towards Venus, right? And when it got to Venus, instead of like landing or anything, it grab assisted. And that grab assist basically swung its trajectory towards the sun. And because, you know... You're already going close to the sun, so you're already falling towards the dang thing. And they had Venus accelerate its fall towards the sun. 400,000 miles an hour. That's probably one of the fastest things that we've ever made. The only thing I can think of that could potentially go, that potentially has gone faster than that is like either New Horizons, Voyager 1, or Voyager 2. That is insanely quick. That's getting to the point where that's like crack and drive fast. Seriously, 400,000 miles an hour. Yeah, seven, yeah, it did seven Venus gravity assists, which is bananas. That shows the crazy... You think it's hard to leave the solar system? It's hard to get close to the sun. That's really, really, really difficult. Because, so think about it like this. If I'm remembering correctly, Earth is orbiting... Our orbital speed around the sun, I mean, keep in mind, Earth is spinning. It's like a big jello mold that's just kind of going around. But our orbital speed is about 60,000 miles an hour, right? So if you want to get to the sun, right, you have to find a way to stop, to slow that down. you got to slow down. So you got to accelerate away from Earth, away from the direction that Earth is going. So away from Earth's posigrade vector, which is... That's not easy to sh to basically hit the brakes when you're going 66,000 miles an hour. That's not easy to do. And then that's just that's just to get like 
near the sun. If you want to like actually get close to the thing, you're gonna you're gonna you need more delta v than that. Can solar sail spacecrafts go even faster? Over time, Tom, Tomas, yeah, sure. It really depends. I, I, I like solar sails, but I'm not too, I'm not sold on them. Also, really awesome picture. Oh, there we go. Guys, go ahead. Yeah, there you just heard it, and you can see it. The engine because you're subject to the you're subject to solar winds, just like a sail. Falcon Heavy rocket now flying through space close to the country of Australia, and you can see it there. We've been tracking it all along. Uh, yes, Watching the country the of Australia, or is it the continent of Australia? That engine, Mick, this burn roughly about two minutes and nine seconds. Yeah, this burn is very important to get Psyche on its way. And Daryl, as you said, we've been tracking that, and as as throughout that 45-minute coast. So what second stage engine start is doing in this second burn here, what it's doing is actually putting the spacecraft on what's called TMI. No, not too much information. It's trans-Martian injection. They're plotting a trajectory, or the, the trajectory was plotted with the second stage here to shoot it at Mars. Psyche is going to go to Mars first, but it ain't landing. It's going to use Mars's gravity to accelerate, and it's going to use it to accelerate actually away from the sun. We're talking the opposite of like Parker Solar Probe here. They're going to basically shoot it towards Mars, and Mars will adjust it. it it'll, it'll change its trajectory, right? So it'll change its orbit depending on their Martian ejection angle. So basically, they're going to go by Mars. Mars's gravity is going to pull it in, but it's not going to be enough to pull it in to, to deorbit it, right? It's going to keep going, and it'll accelerate out of Mars's grav well uh, uh, on escape velocity out of Mars. And they're going to use use Mars Grav Assist to do a, a trans-psyche injection burn, or a trans-psyche injection trajectory. Basically... They're playing pinball with the gravitational pull of the planets, and it's going to bounce off, not bounce off literally, like actually bounce off Mars. It's going to use Mars gravity. It's going to bounce off the grav well to get out to the outer parts of the solar system. Surfing the gravitational wells with spacecraft is pretty much the best way to do it right now. The only way to do it better would be if we had a much bigger rocket. Starship, SLS. <clears throat> Sorry, Saturn V. <clears throat> I had something in my throat there. But, you know, since we don't have these super heavy launch vehicles surfing the gravity... Oh, second stage engine cutoff. There's some nozzle oscillations there. There's Seco 2. Shut down. Still glowing red, though, in the cold darkness See the vent? of space. We are in orbital night on the Helium other purge. side of the planet from where we launched this morning. Nominal payload deploy orbit insertion. Okay. Confirm. So that's nominal orbit insertion, meaning that the trans-Martian injection is... Good enough to get the mission going. Nominal insertion means that you're good within a nominal range, meaning you're close enough to the final trajectory where the spacecraft can do, can do minute modifications to the trajectory with its thrusters to make sure that it's on the right path to not crash into Mars and use Mars's gravity to shoot out towards the outer rim of the solar system. Would nerve rockets help? Absolutely, caffeine. Yeah, absolutely. A a big rocket like SLS with a nuclear upper stage. Um, so here's the thing about Delta V, all right? The more Delta V you have, the further you can go. But it's not a, it's not really about distance, all right? It's about how fast you can go. If you can go faster, you can generally go further. Spacecraft range is measured in acceleration, not not distance, right? So if you looked at a rocket scientist and said, oh yes. The rocket's range needs to be 250,000 miles to get to a, to get to the moon. Now that is the distance that the moon is away from Earth. It's about a quarter of a million miles away, right? However, that's so. All right, who cares? That it's that's not about distance. About how fast you can go. If you said that to a rocket scientist, they'd look at you funny. What? The way to understand this is that you need to be going a certain speed to be able to get out of Earth's grav well or get high enough in Earth's grav well to have the moon pull you in. That's called a translunar injection burn. That's what they did during Apollo. Now, it's not just about it's not just about that. Like, you know, a Saturn V can move a pretty big payload out to the moon on a reasonable trajectory, but a Saturn V could move a smaller payload out like a Psyche mission. If we put if we had a Saturn V and we put 
Psyche on it, it would be able to get there a lot faster. You might not even need to do a, a Mars gravity assist because you can use more of that energy to accelerate the spacecraft, right? So it could get out there faster. That's called a higher energy transfer. Delta V isn't just about range, all right? Delta V, and that's getting into spacecraft character, launch vehicle characteristic energy, or C3. Like, how much energy does it have? And how much of that energy can you use to accelerate in that direction? It's not just about, you know, getting the spacecraft to go further. Transit time has a lot to do with it. And that's where Nerva really will, really, really will help. A super heavy launch vehicle like Falcon 9 with a, or not Falcon 9, uh, like Starship with like a nuclear second stage or a nuclear powered Starship. I know those clickbait YouTube videos salivate over that kind of stuff, but or like a Saturn V or an SLS with a nuclear third stage. Now the nuclear third stages have are probably about twice as efficient because of how a nuclear thermal rocket operates. Uh, instead of combusting stuff, nuclear thermal rockets just have a nuclear reactor inside of a rocket engine, combustion chamber. Yeah, and they just flow hydrogen over the combustion chamber. No combustion happens, but since nu 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 Nuclear materials, if you uh, moderate them, right, you can get them to fizz and give off a lot of heat really, really fast if you increase the reaction, right? They just use hydrogen to cool a nuclear reactor, but it's inside of a rocket engine. I say that like that's some easy thing to do. Um, so the nuclear engines, due to how they actually don't really combust anything, they just heat up gas and accelerate it, which is inherently what, all about rocket. Like, that's what a rocket does. It just it uses combustion to heat up gases and shoot it out the back. Like, think about if you have a balloon and you blow up the balloon, you let it go. It, that balloon isn't combusting anything. It's just shooting gases out the back. Now, the rockets generate a crazy amount of heat to do the same thing because you want to get the gases to expand. And if they expand, they move faster and you shoot them out a nozzle and they go even faster. Pretty straightforward convergent divergent rocket design, right? Now with a nuclear engine, because there's no combustion and you're using hydrogen, super freaking efficient. We're talking a we're talking a twofold increase in efficiency. And with that twofold increase, right? Obviously you don't have to refuel as much because you're twice as efficient. If you're driving on a road trip and you, you drive a road trip with like a big pickup truck, right? You know that's going to get a certain amount of fuel efficiency. That's going to get like, what, 20 miles to the gallon. And if then if you did it in a Prius, Prius will get like 40 miles to the gallon, right? So you don't have to fill up as less. Uh, you don't have to fill up as much. It, 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 it's easier to do, right? Spacecraft kind of work like that in that regard. With a nuclear engine, because you're twice as efficient, right? You don't need to, re you don't need to refuel as much. Simultaneously, because you have more delta V, not only can you go further, but you can get to places faster. Like a nuclear transfer, a nuclear rocket doing a transfer burnout to the moon, like say in some cool alternative timeline where we didn't stop using the Saturn V, they wanted to do a nuclear third stage. And that nuclear third stage would could, could have theoretically improved transit time out to the moon. It took three days with regular hydrogen and oxygen combustion, right, with, with an S-4B. A nuclear-powered S-4B could get you out there, I don't know, you could probably, I mean, this is just some off the top of my head math, you could probably reduce that transit time because you have more energy and you could do a higher energy transfer. You could reduce that transit time by at least a day, at the very least. That's that's at the very, very least. So nuclear, nu the nuclear engines can really, really, you know, we were talking about, you know, born too early to explore the stars. If nuclear engines do what we think they're going to do, and NASA did restart its nuclear program, uh, NASA is going to launch a nuclear propulsion engine. There's spacecraft separation right there. NASA will do that in 2026, at least as a demo. If those things actually take off and we it really becomes an industry standard, we're not looking at getting to Mars in three months every 26 months. We're looking at getting to Mars in a month every 26 months. That right there is a huge difference. Psyche spacecraft se separation right there confirmed. Right there in the lower left hand right corner they are anxious as they see their baby go off into space we'll see phil an asteroid named psyche same as the mission would a polar gravitational so assist have psyche greater performance over a regular assist from the equator circle, which is where it attached to the payload adapter that circle down at the bottom it's a low gain antenna and that low gain antenna will play a key role 
Uh, would a polar gravitational assist have greater performance over a regular gravitational assist? Seven, it really depends on what the axis of rotation is around said body. You can have a polar orbit, but if the planet has some kind of crazy axial tilt, no, probably not. The reason why is because you get a velocity gain if you're if you're going with the direction that the planet. Well, now that's more about that's more for launching. It it really depends on what you're grab assisting off of, dude. To be honest, you could do polar, but generally because I mean more or less, it's not it's not like uniform like it is in Kerbal. More or less, all the planets are rotating around like a like on a disc, so to speak. Right? It's the, the, now keep in mind, it's not called like a planetary disk. That is something completely different. Um, but it really depends on what you're grav assisting around. Like, you know, I don't think inherently that you're going to gain anything from doing polar. You would, you would grav assist polar off of a planet if you needed a trajectory optimization. But since most of our planets are in the solar system are on a relatively similar plane, they don't need to do anything like that. Now, once again, there are missions where if you want the trajectory of your satellite to be not kind of in line with that kind of disk, so to speak, of like where all the planets are, then yeah, you'd do a polar assist. Polar assist is more for trajectory optimization. It really depends on what you're doing, what planet you're grav assisting off of, and where you're going. I mean, there's more mass and less gravity around the equator. That's not necessarily true synthesis, right? Planets don't have uniform gravitational pull. Not even Earth does. The gravitational pull at the poles is different than it is at the equator, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that every single planet is like that. If we were grav assisting off Earth, yeah, you'd want to go closest, the closest that you can get to the grav well. And the equator is the closest physically that you can get to the center of gravity of Earth. Now, keep in mind... Planets aren't planets aren't perfect spheres. They're, they're like nothing is nothing that occurs up there, or down here. This planet, other planets, they, they look like perfect spheres to us, but they're absolutely not. Just because it's more or less round on the outside doesn't necessarily mean that it's perfectly uniform all the way to the center of the planet. The crazy part about that, the crazy part about that is, is that Earth, for instance, if you like cut Earth at the geometric center. So like you tried to cut it and you have two halves, right? Guess what? One of those halves would have more mass than the other. Meaning that the center of gravity of Earth is not necessarily like dead center, like equidistant between the poles, equidistant on the equator. Because Earth is this giant churning and bubbling jello mold of a planet kind of just floating through space, you know? you're not going to get uniform gravitational pull. This offset center of gravity is what that's what causes precession. Well documented. Uh, so a spacecraft orbiting around the planet, eventually it'll, it, its orbit will get influenced enough uh, that it could bring it back down. The moon is the same way. The moon got hit with a lot. It, when, it, when the moon formed, it got hit with a lot of things. You can tell because the, you know, all the craters on that thing. Even the darker gray basaltic, lo lower basaltic regions on the moon, that's the remnants of getting hit by something extremely large. <laughs> so the point is that then these planets are perfect spheres. They're not, the density of the, of the materials in each planet is not, is not completely uniform. So it, that's why I say like seven, it really depends on what you're going around. What planet are you going around? On Earth, for Earth, yeah, you'd want to you'd want to be near the equator if you're doing a grav assist, right? But if that trajectory, if the trajectory that it that you're calling for needs to basically shoot out on a normal function, right? If you're doing a grav assist off Earth and you need a normal component, a normal velocity component added to your spacecraft, a polar gravity assist is going to do that. And well, it's not the most efficient way to do it. If you didn't do a polar assist, you'd miss where you're trying to go. So trajectory optimization is, you know, especially when it comes to doing grav assist is huge because it really depends on what planet you're going to or celestial body or moon or wherever.
Don't cut it. We need it like it is now. All right. Yeah, yeah. I won't do that. Once nuclear power is normalized, do you think we'll get miniaturized nuclear reactor? Or is, there a, or is there a physics limit? There's no physics limit to how small a nuke can be watching. Uh, no. The, the ones that... The, so, once again, a nuke, that's a good question. Uh, a nuclear engine is just a nuclear reactor inside of a rocket engine. And the thing about space flight is that you, you can't... That launching big stuff is very, very difficult because of Earth, Earth's grav well. The thing that literally made us who we are is also the thing that really it makes it really hard to leave this planet. <laughs> That's why the first stages on rockets are so much bigger than the second stages, right? Um, uh, so, like, to get a reactor inside of a rocket engine, it's going to be compact already. You know what the crazy thing about this is, dude? We were doing this in the 60s. The Apollo program was going to switch to a nuclear-powered third stage. And with that nuclear-powered third stage, yeah, we, that, that, yeah. You're already, uh, like, yeah, you're already doing compact, compact nuclear reactors. The, the nuclear engines that were going to get used, so Nerva, uh, the nuclear thermal rocket that they were designing for the Apollo program was no bigger than a semi-truck. Yep, they have, they've locked the frequency on the short band for Psyche. Uh, mission elapsed time is T plus one hour, nine minutes, 42. The start of a very, very, very long journey. I just got here. What I missed? The Psyche launch, dude. Yeah, nuclear reactors in space. The Soviet Union and the United States during the space race both tested standalone nuclear reactors, not even nuclear thermal propulsion. Standalone nuclear reactors. They work. They work in space. Compact. Very compact, actually. Yeah. Uh, they got they got reactor sizes down to, oh, I don't know, maybe the size of a car engine. So, yeah, this, this stuff's already there. It's one of those things we just got to do, you know? Did I miss the launch? Yep. Psyche is downlinking per the Deep Space Network. Let's check DSN now. All right, so you're looking at a live shot here of what the NASA's Deep Space Network is communicating with. We have all kinds of stuff. That one's communicating with the trace gas orbiter. That one's communicating with the reconnaissance orbiter. And yeah, the Perseverance M20. MRO is the reconnaissance orbiter. Wind, I'm not sure what wind is. Yep, there we go. Madrid 55 is communicating with Parker Solar Probe. 56 is communicating. It's marked as OSIRIS-REx, but it's uh, OSIRIS-APEX now. They changed the name of the mission now that the, the asteroid sample return is over. Uh, here we go. Goldstone 25 is pointed at Psyche, but it's not actually transmitting because there's an Earth in the way. So, Canberra 34 right here, which is a small, small antenna. I think that's a 50-meter antenna, is communicating with Psyche and 35 right there. What frequency are they on? Uh, it's not here. More detail. Let's see. Oh, there we go. They're on uh, X band frequency. Yep. Cool. Are they both communicating on the same frequency? Yep. 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 In what world? The 50 antenna is small. Yeah, these guys are like 40, 50 meter antennas. These guys are 70 meter antennas. 70 meters. That's 220 feet across. It's a gigantic freaking dish. That's huge. It's ridiculous that we can make something like that just pivot around and move. Because you got to remember, it's a parabolic antenna. It's directional. It needs to be pointed at the spacecraft. So think about a spacecraft crossing the sky in low Earth orbit at 17,500 miles an hour. That thing needs to follow it if it's using it for communications. These smaller antennas are... That is not a small mass to move, like, about this quick. 
to follow a target across the sky. They move pretty damn fast for how big they are. Because they have to. Why do they have to? Just in case anybody... Because I didn't lay it on thick enough. Why do they have to move that fast? Well, the antenna has to be pointed at the spacecraft. That that would help if you want to communicate with it. Because these are directional antennas. They yeah, you, you got to point it at it. Just putting it out there. There actually is nuclear fission is super sensitive to volume and geometry. There are only so many tricks we could do to boost the reaction rates before there isn't just enough material. Close enough. Yeah, I suppose I didn't get the last part of that question, Aqualex. Like, how, is there a theoretical limit to how small we can make it? Well, yeah, absolutely. That's the case with most things. But yeah, 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 good point. Fun fact, dude. This is how an amateur astronomers do it. If you could figure out your theta, uh, your azimuth theta, so your, or your azimuth delta, excuse me, not theta. Theta would be the angle. If you could figure out azimuth delta here, so see how it's 22 to 23 degrees? If you can figure out the rate of change, right, you can pretty much predict exactly what orbit it's in. From that rate of change, you can figure out how fast the spacecraft is going across the sky. And keep in mind, that speed can vary if you're in a not perfectly circular orbit. So the azimuth change, the rate of change on the azimuth can actually, will actually modulate depending on what type of orbit it is. So like it'll start really, really fast on the horizon and then it could slow down or it could speed up and then slow down again, right? That rate of change from the rate of change here on the azimuth, so basically where the antenna is pointed, you can figure out spacecraft's velocity. And if you figure out the velocity at that point in time over that part of the earth, you can absolutely figure out what orbit it's in. People do this with telescopes, which is still blows my mind. They see how fast a spacecraft is moving across like the screen, like they have a video camera plugged into a telescope. You figure out how fast it's moving across the screen, you can discern what exactly what orbit it's in, which is really cool. Cuz once again, spacecraft range is spacecraft the name of the game with how spacecraft move around and how they how we fig how we understand how they move around in space, speed focus speed i am speed I, the name of the game is you know acceleration how, how fast can you go if you can go faster you can usually go further or if you go faster you can get there quicker <laughs> i like that part that part's cool you can go a shorter distance but you can get there quicker did you watch that asimov interview yet no john i i think i lost the link dude why do we let the giant radio antenna in Puerto Rico fall into such disrepair? So you're talking about Arecibo, Tigris. Uh, why did that happen? Because we're stupid. That's why that happened. That's how they've done it for centuries. Yeah, Galileo with his damn telescope, man. Yeah, I don't have a better. I don't have a better explanation, Tigris. I can sit here. And I could explain the circumstances. Basically, a university was funding was funding the antenna for research, and that research it was through grants, and that research grant stopped. So the university couldn't handle doing the maintenance on the antenna, let alone doing science with it by themselves. So they just said, "Screw it, whatever. We're not going to maintain an antenna if no one's using it." And that was the end of that. So they deferred maintenance. I could sit here and be a Debbie Downer about that, or I could just say we're stupid. Because stupidity. I, I'd prefer the I'd prefer that explanation. Alright, John, I have the link now. Oh, it's a Letterman interview with Asimov from 1980. Oh, cool. Let's check that out. Huh, I heard it was also partially a manufacturing er error. Nick, I have never I've never heard anything like that. It was a manufacturing issue and the structure failed like everything else you don't maintain maintain. I've not heard this. I mean, it's very possible that it both there's both of these explanations, but what 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 do you mean a manufacturing error? I don't, 
I don't understand. Like, I know what a manufacturing error is, but like Stellar, here's the thing. You, you could have a manufacturing error, right? But it doesn't matter if you have a manufacturing error if you don't maintain it. It's possibility. There's a possibility that the manufacturing error probably called for more maintenance than what was required, which does make sense in that regard. But what do you mean? What do you mean manufacturing error? I'm not like what was the what was the details of that? Didn't operate at the tolerance that it needed to. Dude, there's a space economy and there's a huge prediction at the end that relates to you. Cool. Personally, I choose to look forward to the Lunar Radio Observatory. Yeah, I, like, I'm in the same way. You know, Arcebo would have been nice to have, but it's gone, so. Onwards and upwards. Something about the anti-corrosion stuff needing increased care beyond what it was designed for. So, so stupidity. Okay. Yeah. I don't really general. I don't really like being very general with my explanations like that, dude. So you know, manufacturing, you know, grants, funding being pulled because of increased maintenance. No one's using the dang thing. Stupid, but also stupidity. Basically, excuse after excuse after excuse after excuse, and now it's collapsed, and now we blame everybody else. It's just yeah, stupid. You know, blame this, blame the manufacturing, blame the funding being pulled, blame the, you know, people not like, people not, you know, wanting to be scientists or whatever. You sit there, you could blame everybody else, or you could just say we're stupid and call it a day and either fix it or don't. Like, it, it seems like a very cynical point of view when it comes to that stuff, but, you know, hope, hopium, hitting the hopium here isn't going to bring the stupid dish back, you know what I mean? Either A, fix that manufacturing defect build the build a new one rebuild the dang thing or you sit there and wallow in sadness and don't rebuild it or you just say screw it and leave it there and just go do something else could have similar arguments for the hadron collider in texas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. pretty sure it was a tactical strike by bananas that's probably the best explanation Morning, was out this morning doing motorcycle things. Just got home. Psyche go off as planned? Oh, yeah. Great freaking mission, dude. Here, I'll, I'll show you guys a replay here. We'll cap off the coverage, and then we'll, we'll jump over into KSP. This is a replay from a little bit earlier. Here we go with the final seconds of launch. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Engine ignition. And lift off. Fly, baby, lift fly. Off Falcon Heavy and Psyche on a mission to a metal asteroid in deep space to study the building blocks of our planet's inner space. Vehicles pitching gun range. What did he say? Hold on. Five, four, three, two, one. Engine ignition. Oh. And lift off. Lift off of Falcon Heavy and Psyche on a mission to a metal asteroid in deep space to study the building blocks of our planet's inner space. Uh, okay. Vehicles pitching gun range. Yeah. And okay, that makes sense. Pressure, it's just a weird way to say that. I will say, Falcon Heavy is a looker. It is a very pretty looking rocket. It needs a bigger fairing, though. Beautiful shot there as it goes through the clouds. I wish there was a website that had all the launch statements for the shuttle missions. Nobody had better launch statements, Bombas, if, we're, if that's what we're going to call it. Like, launch exclamations, I guess. Nobody had better ones than George Diller. George Diller was a famous shuttle NASA commentary. Like, dude, that guy is like one of my idols. I strive to be as good as he, him or my absolute favorite rocket commentator was Walter Cronkite. Nobody did it better than him. And I base a lot of my explanations off... I've listened to tons of uh, commentary from him. I base a lot of my explanations uh, and style off of, off of Cronkite because he was a space nutcase and he was a damn good reporter. 
him, George Diller, Rob Navius. Heck, if any, if you want, if you really want to go newer, John Insprucker, who was is not a journalist and is not a commentator by trade. He's an engineer by trade. Is a damn good commentator. Even like if you want to get into the newer crowd, like Gary Jordan, Dan Hewitt. Gary Jordan's a NASA PAO. Dan Hewitt was a NASA PAO. He works for SpaceX now. Kate Kate Tice at SpaceX. She does a fantastic job. They're great commentators. Uh, and Jesse Anderson, of course. Jesse's Jesse's great. She she does such a good job. You know, those are those are the people that I you know, George Diller, Rob Navius, and Cronkite are those that's what I strive to be. George Diller's commentary was oh, it was the best, dude. The best. It really he really just got that um like commentary that captures your imagination. Like this is what I try to do when I commentate. I I, I my rule of thumb for commentary is, okay, don't just say what's on the screen. Don't just say the time. Don't just say, you know, booster separation confirmed. We got good staging. Like, I mean, you that's cool to do that, right? I think, what is somebody going to hear? If they don't have the stream up, if they if they're just listening, so like, what are those people in their car going to hear? Yes, I know, I hear you. I know you're in your car right now. Hey, look at the road. Don't look at me. What's wrong with you? Or people that are just have audio only. I try to paint a picture for them. That's what I try to do. I try to go radio, like do a radio commentary because it's easy to see what's going on with the picture, and the picture is breathtaking. But. If I can supplement that with great visual commentary, you're gonna hit the you're gonna hit the ball out of the park. <laughs> Raz like 83 month resub. Yep. Yeah, I know you're driving in your car. That's fine. Hey, I, hey, eyes on the road. Stop looking at your radio. What? I'm not gonna pop out of your dang radio. Look at the, look at the road. There's a red light coming up. What's wrong with you? It's, I know somebody's out there that's like, how the hell did he know that? It's because I'm good, man. It's because I'm good. Because my life's dope and I like to do dope things. Don't forget John Galloway. Great commentator, too. Yeah, he's pretty good. Please keep doing that. It's fantastic and a big help. <laughs> Check your mirrors. Seriously, though. Maybe it's just because I'm paranoid. And I... Because because I drive around in Boston a lot. I'm checking the mirrors like every 30 seconds because you never know when someone's going to swipe across like four or five lanes. I don't trust people, all right? <laughs> I, don't, I don't trust people on the road, man. I don't know how you drive. You probably drive like crap. Get away from me. <laughs> Check your mirrors. And use your blinker. <laughs> and buckle up. What's wrong with you? You don't want to get hit by one of these idiots that don't know how to drive. Because most likely, they're driving a car that they don't understand is two tons of mass. And if that hits you, it's going to hurt. Put your buckle on. <laughs> Montage of George Diller. Dude, his commentary on EFT1 is burned into my head like a liftoff at dawn. The dawn of Orion and a new era in human spaceflight. Oh, that's, dude, it gives me goosebumps even saying it. Thirty thirty seconds on a motorbike, your head's on a swivel or your street pizza. Well, we're talking about cars, not motorbikes. Don't change the subject, Tessa. <laughs> oh, dude, this this is just fantastic. What a good day. So far, this is the worst day of worst day of my life. It's the worst day of your life so far. Yeah, there you go. There you go, caveman. The cable cup where they poured the metal into secured it pulled through much less force than it was supposed to. Something about material choice not being to spec. So, yeah. Laziness. Shortchanging things. It, it, oh, I'm about to get on the soapbox and I don't want to. 
Screw you for making me say this. There was a time where we actually put quality work into things. And, you know, putting quality work into things makes sure they last longer. And actually get you the result that you want instead of shortchanging every step that you do. Oh, okay. Alright. <clears throat> That's why I like space flight. Because you can't do that. And if you do, you lose. Badly. It has to be made right. Because you're not beating physics if you try to, sh if you try to skimp. It's part of the reason why I like it so much. Okay, boomer. Boomer moment. <laughs> I'm getting off my soapbox now. Just to think about the fact that it's Friday the 13th in October. Yep. Yep, no I'm not. That's why I hate the age of minimal minimalist engineering. Yep. 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 Nickel and dime yourself. Why don't you just increase your chance of failure? Sure. Why not? It's fine. Kenny, you think that <laughs> capitalism has the effect of encouraging cutting corners? Mm, whatever we're doing nowadays, yeah. But I wouldn't call that that. I mean, I disagree. There was a time, you know, like, for instance, I have a 25-year-old truck sitting in my driveway. And it's it's 25 years old and has 175,000 miles on it. And the thing's fine. Get that out of a modern vehicle. I mean, you probably could, to be fair, but it's built to freaking last, man. There, In fact, there are times where it's done the opposite of what you said, you know? Like, uh, that's what I mean. I think we should probably go back to doing that, but whatever. Whatever. I'm getting off the soapbox. I just want to watch Rockets land. What do you mean by minimalist engineering? I understand. That's a good thing. Human person... You... Hey, Joe, what's going on? Wait, what did you just say? I, I saw something about trains. I'm chasing Norfolk and Western 611 tomorrow. Nice, nice. Nice, nice. Yeah, that's right, Mayor. I've driven my 25-year-old 330,000 miles and driving another 500 home. Yep, yep. 175, Tigris. Yeah, well, hey, there's a lot of... <laughs> there's a lot of... <laughs> A lot of people in chat talking about a lot of different things, man. I'm trying to keep up. You know, everybody, it highlights the chat when people tag at me, but the thing is, is that the entire chat is a big block of red, so it's not really helping. <laughs> it's not really helping, dude. <laughs> yeah. Human person, see what see what Aqualex said. That's pretty, that's pretty right. How was the launch? Great, man. Normal chat's just become the highlight. Norfolk. Yeah, Norfolk. Norfolk is up here, and our Norfolk is older than your Norfolk. Dang, Delmarva stooge. Yeah, that's right. I said it. I'm from the Northeast. I'm supposed to do that. Yeah, yeah, Kenny, that's the thing. We're in that that yeah, that's what I'm talking about, dude. We're so we're so driven by trying to skirt the bottom line by making something that's just good enough for it, but it actually doesn't last. It doesn't last very long. Not entirely realizing that if you build stuff to last long, if you build stuff to stand the test of time, you're not going to need to maintain it as much and over time over time the original expense incurred pays for itself it you act because you don't you don't have to maintain it all the time because it wasn't built just to be good enough over engineering is key especially with infrastructure like that i don't like that I, everything is driven by a bottom line which i think is very very uh it's it's all driven by short term and i don't like that i don't i don't think that's that's not healthy we got to build stuff to last i mean look at the coliseum in Rome, for instance, that was built to last. It literally survived getting set on fire and destroyed multiple times. And it's still standing. Just saying. Pantheon, same idea. You want to build stuff like that. 
the Pantheon in Rome, or even like I, I mean, I if you want to go for it, the Eiffel Tower, the you know the Arc de Triomphe in France, Brandenburg Gate. All this stuff is built like that for a reason. The pyramids, yeah, great example. Great example if you want to go back into super late antiquity, the Parthenon in Greece. Parthenon's still standing, and people literally tried to destroy it. It was sacked because it was seen as a pagan monument, and it's still standing because they couldn't they couldn't destroy it enough. They destroyed half of it and said, ah, "Screw this, let's go do something else." Seriously, they got bored. That, that's ridiculous. So is the NASA VAB built up to Roman concrete? The VAB is one of those things, Christian. That thing is built to last, man. They broke the mold when they made that thing. Stonehenge? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Still, still don't figure out how the frick they did that, dude. But yeah, that's what I mean, dude. We gotta build stuff like that. The Eiffel Tower is only meant to be temporary, though. Yeah, Guayron, interesting, right? Yeah, wasn't it for a World's Fair or something like that, if I'm remembering right? I, I don't know. The Bundestag. Yeah, if you... Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, that... That's the kind of stuff, man. You gotta be, we should be building stuff like that. Stuff to last. Because if you build something to last, you're not going to have to maintain it as much. And you end up saving a lot of money over time because you don't have to pay people to maintain the stupid thing. Eiffel, Eiffel Tower was a world... It was part of the World's Fair and then converted to a radio tower. Cool. Cool. Anyway. Well, anyway, that's going to do it for the Psyche for the psyche mission, guys. Yeah. We had, it's a great mission. It's a great, great mission. I, I really hope we learn something with Psyche. And I really want it to prospect that thing because... There is, I'll just end on this note. Let, you know, anybody here that's watched The Expanse knows what I'm about to say. There's a lot of resources out there in the asteroid belt. The problem is there's trillions of dollars worth of resources. The problem is right now, it's cheaper to just dig it out of the ground than it is to go and get it. We should change that. And hopefully Psyche will give us some new insight into how to do that. What is the Psyche ETA? It's got to do a Mar it's got to do a couple of grab assists off Mars, Jay Gibbs, from what I understand. I haven't seen the actual whole trajectory of the thing. I know it's going to get near Mars and shoot off that probably once or twice if I had to guess, and uh, it should get that it should get out there in 2029. Be there. Trillions that would take quadrillions to get. That's right, Uncommoner. Yep. But see, like, here's the thing. If you look at, like, material extraction out of this planet, dude, there was a time where there were certain oil deposits that we knew about that we couldn't get to, right? But eventually, we figured out a way to do it. Fracking, for instance, which is incredibly bad for the crust, I will say, but it does get you those resources. That's nice. The resource part is nice. Uh, yeah, fr fracking turns out injecting concrete into the crust, which, you know, moves around and putting concrete in there to try and make it stationary to extract oil that you know that concrete makes it so when it tries to move around it ends up being catastrophically bad because yeah it moves around crust and stuff so psyche a planetary core it they think it's a protoplanet mythic that's nasa thinks it's a protoplanet so long story short you have asteroids out there that are made out of denser materials than other asteroids because it's made out of denser materials like Rare earth metals, iron, nickel, stuff like that. Maybe even tungsten. Who knows? There's a couple of other things in there. Well, we won't know what, what it's made out of until NASA gets near the thing and actually takes a look. Sometimes you just got to go out there and put a, put a camera out on, on it, right? And just look at it. <laughs> Would you just look at it? Just look at it. Well, look at that. Would you just look at that? Anyway, uh, NASA in 2029 looking at the Psyche asteroid, probably. Um Like, uh, hang on. I lost my train of thought. Yeah, uh, talking about mining, right? Like, you know, we we will we'll figure out ways to go and get this stuff eventually. There's and that that's part of the reason why like SpaceX is trying to make getting into space something routine. 
Because if you can get into space, the amount of energy that you need to get into like low Earth orbit is pretty much the amount of energy that you need to get anywhere in the solar system. That's not my. That's not a quote from me. I think. I think that's an Asimov quote. But anyway, yeah, those those protoplanets, right? That those metallic asteroids have more gravitational pull, and they think this is how Earth formed, right? You know, they end up pulling in stuff that's lesser material because they have more gravitational pull, and then you know it eventually pulls in enough stuff spore style to become a planet. <laughs> Who knew? Maybe finding a new kind of metal. Sure. Yeah, it's a hydraulic slurry, not quite concrete. Yeah, exactly, Uncommoner. I, I, I used concrete. It's a little bit of hyperbole on my part. I use concrete because the slurry does eventually solidify, if I'm understanding it right. But <laughs> we know that fracking is bad for the planet. We understand that. There's a lot of things that we do that's bad for the planet. I, I, I mean, the, the whole premise of this conversation is maybe we should find a cheaper way to go up there and get the material up there so we don't have to get it here. So we can not screw up this planet. I mean, even if you, even if you're like not sold on us screwing up the planet like that, right? There definitely is a finite amount of resources here. We'll exhaust it eventually. Just get it from up there. Easier. Well, not right now, but in the future it probably would be. Future, you don't need to mine anything. The asteroid's just a big floating ball of metal. Just go and get it. <laughs> Way easier. But the problem is, is getting something there to go and get it. Which, once again, that's why SpaceX is doing what they're doing. That's why they're trying to make launches boring. That's Elon's stated goal. Because he knows that, dude, you can sit here and say you want a city on the moon, you want a city on Mars. That's great. All right. How are you going to get it there? How are you going to get the city and the people there? That's the most important part. Look at, like, uh, the western parts of the United States. Like, look at cities that are out there. Like, look at Las Vegas, for instance. Las Vegas is... Quite literally in the middle of a freaking desert. But it's this thriving city in the middle of a desert. Same with Phoenix, same with Tucson. There's you, there's no... Unless we... Without the, the railroads, there's no freaking way making a settlement there would have been a good idea at all. The railroads is what made that possible. It's the infrastructure that allows us to expand. And that's why I'm such a big fan of SpaceX, Right? Because they're building space infrastructure, right? Now, contrast that to, like, NASA, for instance. NASA's scientific understanding, right? So, I also like SLS, despite OIG wanting to undermine it at every single freaking corner. Uh, I also like that, too. Because scientific understanding is different than building out infrastructure in space, NASA kind of conflated the two with the space shuttle and didn't really work too well. Why did NASA hire SpaceX? In what regard, Dutchman? Um, the, the real reason is that the space infrastructure is good, man. If somebody already has a train track that's going to get out to your remote city, why would you build another train track? Use what they, are, use what they have to your advantage. But that doesn't mean, you know, if you're going to build more train tracks and you're going to find a more remote location, that doesn't mean that you're not going to need to build your own stuff eventually. So I don't mind NASA building their own rockets and why I don't mind SpaceX building their own rockets. Because one of these is a scientific exploration vehicle and the other one is a semi-truck that drives into space. Two different things. You don't, you don't go camping in a semi-truck. You don't go and explore with a tractor trailer. That's not designed for that. It's not that's that wouldn't even get you very far. I would say the space shuttle was a success. Uh, full. I'm a space shuttle fanboy, dude. I still believe to this day. You know, this is ten years retrospective, right? Like after the shuttle, I, I know a lot about that thing, uh, and I firmly believe that the shuttle's design was not the problem. Shuttle's design was not the problem. The management management. Too much middle management is what killed that program. If you look at the root cause of both failures, management miscalculation. Both of them. And that's what I mean when I say, when I say like, is it a semi-truck or is it an RV? NASA conflated the two, right? And you ended up getting something that was pretty much good at nothing. 
NASA was trying to build a vehicle and trying to make it work like a semi-truck and building the infrastructure to low Earth orbit. So they were trying to do basically what SpaceX is trying to do right now. That was their stated goal. Build a, build a, a cheaper avenue. So it's a statistic that's cited a lot in spaceflight economics. So how much does it cost to put a dollar or how much does it cost to put a kilogram into space? So 2.2 pounds. How much does it cost to put two pounds up there? Right? If you can reduce the dollars per kilogram, you know, you can the, the you can basically take all the costs of the launch vehicle and you can use that for more scientific understanding. But is somebody going to build a rocket that goes to the moon because there's a market for it? No. Absolutely not. There's no there's no market for it. If I hit the Powerball right now and I built a, a big enough rocket somehow that could get to the moon, right? Would I have any customers? No. NASA would probably be like, really? And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, it's because I'm good like that, right? <laughs> no, it's, it's a joke. But that once again, that's the train tracks to where a city could be in the future in our infrastructure, land infrastructure analogy that we got going. So... You know, like it's two sides of a different coin. That's why I, you know, I love what SpaceX does. And I think SpaceX is how we're going to get to the point where, you know, maybe in the future where NASA doesn't need their own rockets. But SpaceX will get to the, you know, you'll get to a point eventually where Starship reaches the end of its line, proverbially. Like it'll go as far as you can go with that type of architecture. And... Are we going to use Starship to go and explore another solar system? Are we going to use Starship as a colony ship? No. That would be up to NASA to build an exploratory vessel like that. But that's like 150 years down the road, you know? So NASA needs to build their own stuff in-house, but it needs. To, but you got to remember, like, even though they're both rockets, they're both spacecraft, SLS is a launch vehicle, Starship is a launch vehicle, right? They're built for different purposes, and it's important to understand that. You speculate that outside just wanted to shut up because it's taking most of the market saying it's with some other venture star in the grid. I mean, yeah, Aquilux. I, I would say if you want to play that card, dude, I was dude, I was actually reading an interest a super interesting paper the other day, and I don't have the damn link for it. I, I hate it. It was one of those things where I'm reading it, and I'm like, wow, this is this is a really interesting way of looking at this. I should bookmark this, and then never did. I forget where I read it. Maybe it was on X or on just out on the internet somewhere. I read this interesting theory that the formation of NASA destroyed the commercial market for spaceflight. Interesting. So, right before Kennedy went into office, so this is, we're talking the last couple of years of Eisenhower's tenure as president, right? He, uh, I'm trying to figure out the right way to say this. He was super worried about arms races and basically like just unregulated arms races and unregulated commercial markets emerging in space, right? Uh, he was super worried about that, that like a healthy commercial market could lead to you know, if there's a commercial market in space, it needs to be regulated somehow. So you're going to need to get the military up there to help keep the peace, blah, 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 blah. Now, so what he ended up doing was make, make the Air Force space, what would become Air Force space and missile systems, right? But also, like, basically, when NASA was formed, they consolidated a lot of, like, uh, projects that were in the commercial market and moved it under NASA's roof. Like, if you think about the first communication satellite, the first satellite that was actually useful for something, Telstar 1. Telstar 1 was a commercial venture. Commercial venture. That ended up, you know, launching on a government rocket, right? It was an entirely commercial venture. Like, there was, a, in the early, early, early 60s, like, right at the dawn of the space race, there was a scramble for commercial markets in space, and NASA, NASA and Air Force Space and Missile Systems basically killed it. Because, they, once again, Eisenhower was super worried. I mean, a lot of people know this. You see this thrown around on every single freaking conspiracy theory website. And 
thread on any social media platform that, you know, Eisenhower was super worried about the military industrial complex and worried about how endless wars are profitable, right? And how endless arms races are profitable. So they didn't want, he didn't want that happening in space. And he thought NASA should be used and launching rockets into space should be used for peaceful exploration and scientific understanding only. So basically, right at the end, like right before Kennedy got into office, he killed all that stuff. So some of those projects ended up coming to fruition, right? But, yeah, they, he absolutely dunked on the commercial market at the beginning of the space race. Those interests that you're talking about. Weird, right? I'm so tired of why do we have more than one rocket question. Rockets are cool. Oh, I'm greedy, John. Like, I, I you know... I could sit here and explain to people the justifications for all these rockets, and they are good justifications, right? I, I think it's important to have something like SLS. It's important to have something like Starship. It's important to have something like Falcon Heavy. But at the end of the day, I'm also not going to sit here and pretend like I don't want just want more rockets because I really like rockets. I really like watching them launch and watching them fly. That makes me really happy. And you know what, man? I'm going to keep doing what makes me happy. And I'm going to keep pushing for what makes me happy. You know why? Because it makes me happy. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, there was a really interesting paper, Hellfish. I, don't, I want to see if I could go find it. I forget where I was reading it, dude. It was, a, it was an op-ed. So, like, it was... So, like, it was just somebody's opinion. But that is basically what happened. And then by the time the shuttle came around, right, they did the same thing again. You know? Yeah. It's not my insight, first of all. It's not, my, that's not, my, that is not an EJ original idea. I don't, believe it or not, dude, even to this day, I, I didn't, I know a little bit about the early parts of the space program. Like how the Air Force decided to go with Titan because that's the rocket that, that's the rocket that the Air Force helped engineer. Even though Saturn 1B was a better vehicle for launching defense payloads into space, the top brass in the Air Force said, no, we, dev we designed this vehicle. We're not using a NASA rocket to launch satellites into space. That's stupid. True story. Yeah, there was a huge competition for what rockets would be used to launch keyhole satellites into space. So basically, proto-evolved expendable launch vehicle, proto-NSSL, at the very beginning of the space program. And even though Saturn 1B is an infinitely better rocket over Titan, pretty much in every single aspect, the Air Force was stubborn. They did an EJ, and they went. They stuck with Titan because, frick you, frick NASA, we're not taking an Army rocket. Because Saturn rockets are derived from Jupiter and Juno and Redstone rockets, which was Army. There, That was developed, those were developed, I mean, it's Von Braun's design, but they were developed and iterated on at the Army Ballistic Missile Agency. The Army Ballistic Missile Agency got folded into NASA in 1958. And the Air Force said, we ain't using no Army rockets. Weird, right? And then the Navy's like, we got Vanguard. Look, it's good. Oh, it blew up on the pad. Nope, nope. N hey, uh, we got Vanguard. We got we got another Vanguard. Look, look, we're going to get into space before... Every oh, it blew up again. We have another Vanguard. Like, look, is it? see? We're... we're our rockets are the best. Oh, it blew up again. Oops. <laughs> Crazy, right? Yeah. Saturn 1B. Now, hear me out, fellas. You guys want to hear a funny one. So Titan is a hypergolic. A hypergolic uh, core stage with solid rocket boosters on the sides, right? And... It's funny, dude. It's funny the copium that the Air Force had to go through. Look at all the different variants of Titan. There's Titan there's Titan 1, there's Titan 2, there's Titan 2AS, there's Titan 3, there's Titan 3A, Titan 3B, Titan Centaur, Titan Transstage, right? Titan 4, right? There's all these different variations of Titan of, of these Titan rockets. Saturn 1 can, Saturn 1V can literally do everything. All, a, anything that a Titan rocket can do. It could do everything that even Rockets that are 30 years contemporary of Saturn 1B's design. So like Titan IV, which is a very good launch vehicle. Saturn 1B can do that. Yeah, it can easily do that. And it could do it in 1963. <laughs> Copium. Cope and C, the Air Force. 
How was the launch? Ah, oh, perfect, Squall. Great launch. Falcon Heavy, man. El Falcon Pasado. Pasado? Yeah, heavy. Yeah, anyway. And now we're destroying Saturn 1Bs. Ah, uh, Hellfish. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if I told you, dude. I heard about that. I, I talked to a guy who talks, who has, a, who does, lifts things. I'm sure you could put two and two together who it is. And he was telling me that the, the hoisting crew that was trying to get that Saturn 1B, they were, dude, they were trying, they were trying to bring it down. And they were using the right hoist points. But the reason why they couldn't take the inner stage off is because the inner stage the, the bolts that were mounting the interstage to the top of that Saturn 1B were one piece. There's there's no bolt. It's just all corroded together. They couldn't they couldn't get it off. That's why they sawed the interstage off. They saw the interstage off so they could get at those damn hoist points. And they got like 90% of the way there and then the hoist points corroded off. The ho hoist points decided they didn't want to hoist anymore. Yeah, that thing was so far gone, dude. It's yeah, it sucks. It sucks that it got like that, but hey, it is what it is. <clears throat> Any more plans for Stormworks? I want to play Kerbal today. Titans are also used for nuclear sub payloads. Eh? What? But yeah, interesting. It, the other interesting thing about, you know, going into Department of Defense launch vehicles is that if you look at all of the Department of Defense launch vehicles that are going to fly now and into the future, with the exception of Falcon, if you look at like Atlas V, Vulcan, let's take Atlas V for instance, Carolock's first stage with the possibility of attaching SRBs, Hydrolock's second stage with a five meter payload fairing, Saturn 1B, Carolock's first stage, Hydrolock second stage, six meter payload fairing. In 1963. Well, technically the Saturn 1B was 1967, but still. The Saturn 1B is literally the perfect Department of Defense launch vehicle. Because you could attach SRBs to the side. Carolock's first stage for the best best first stage performance. Hydrolock second stage at S4B with a J2, right? And a six meter payload fairing. It's exactly what the Department of Defense needed for launching spy satellites, and they didn't do it because we're not using an army rocket. Seriously, they top brass was like very adamant about Titan. <clears throat> and they ended up having to do all this stuff to Titan over the years to get it to do what a Saturn 1B could do in the 60s. I, I still think that's funny. That's hilarious to me. Copium. See? That thing. Oh, yeah. Also, it's human rated, by the way. Yeah. Because it's a Saturn 1B. Any insider information on KSB2? We should be seeing an update on the horizon here sooner rather than later, Hand. Not going to say exactly when. Yeah, see? This capability. All this. MSFC 68. So this is this is a basically a the 60s version of a PowerPoint. Let's we'll call it a slideshow of all the different vehicle configurations for for S1B. How long would Saturn have been used had they gone with it? Would there still be variants in use today? I'm going to switch this over to Kerbal, Tars. Uh, you reminded me because I was thinking about rocket design. Um, so, VT, VL, SSTO, 